Welcome to a celebration of hope. I'm Walter Johnson with the Judy Nicholson Foundation. We thank you for your time for coming to share this special occasion with us. <clears throat> We're here because we believe that with our efforts and our collective partnerships, we can one day eradicate kidney cancer. We're on a mission. We're not going to stop until it's done. We are grateful for all of the presenters that are coming today to share with us. We thank you for tuning in those online. We're going to take our time today. We don't want to overbook your time, but we thank you for sharing this day with us. Again, welcome to this celebration of hope. And we pray and hope that as you share and gain this information, valuable knowledge that's coming from our presenters today. It will encourage you to help not only yourself, but some of us. I'm going to present Dr. Rashawn, who will come. Well, first, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for being here Saturday morning. I know it can be difficult to wake up. We prefer to be at home having a lazy morning breakfast and enjoying the day. And. Uh, you all of you decided to come and this <coughs> is what makes this type of uh, events a success and we, we really thank you for that and uh, uh, as Walter said this is a celebration of hope we uh, are going to give uh, uh, presentations and uh, uh, talks about different aspects of kidney cancer from how to treat it uh, surgery, uh, medical treatments, nutrition, psychological aspects, etc. And uh, we do that because we believe that knowledge is power. Okay? We want our patients to have the power okay, with all the knowledge that they have to make informed decisions, okay, to make the right choices, and hopefully to come with very, very good outcomes. Okay? I see a lot of patients here I see also a lot of our support staff and research staff, okay? We have uh, from nurse practitioners to research coordinators to basic scientists who are here, all of us trying to find the cure for kidney cancer, okay? And here at Sylvester, we are proud to say that we are at the forefront of research, both in the laboratory and in the clinic in kidney cancer, okay? We have outstanding urological surgeons, outstanding medical oncologists, radiation doctors, oncologists, all of us come together to work for you. So, um, uh, today uh, we're going to start our talk uh, with a patient, okay? A very, very special patient of ours who has a very powerful story. And uh, she is going to, to uh, describe and talk about her journey, okay, her ups and downs. And uh, please feel free to uh, ask questions, okay? Or maybe if you want to, to share a little bit of your story as well, we will be happy to help. So uh, I, am, I have the honor to introduce uh, Mrs. Raquel Koffer, a patient who will be talking about her journey for kidney cancer, okay? Thank you so much, Dr. Mishan, for inviting me to participate in this symposium. Thank you, uh, the Judy uh, Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation, for allowing me this opportunity to share my story, my journey with kidney cancer, inspire others, and perhaps um, finding their journey through their disease. My name is Raquel Kaufler. And my diagnosis is renal cell carcinoma, clear cell, stage four, metastasis in the lungs. Before I share my story, um, I would like to speak about my mom. Um, back in 2008, my mom was diagnosed with a very aggressive, high-grade sarcoma in soft tissue. And she was, her prognosis was not very good. She had several <clears throat> surgeries, about nine. She had radiation. 
She came to UN, Sylvester. I would take care of her. I would bring her every single day for months at 7 in the morning, wait for her, care for her, take her home, and then I would go and back to work. I did that for many years. Um, and also my sister, also a, our caregiver, um, we, we were by her side and very much involved with her treatment. It was a very difficult time in all of our lives. We lost her in 2010. After spending so much time with her, um, doing research for cancer, being here in the hospital, speaking to her doctors and staff and nurses, I, I was, I had acquired so much knowledge about cancer that when I got diagnosed, I, I had the feeling that I knew that I was going to get cancer because I knew so much about it. And so, um, 2012, January, I get diagnosed with kidney cancer. You can imagine how my life felt. Um, my world came tumbling down. I thought that it was the end of me. <clears throat> life was over. And that was it. <laughs> Um, I would think about the surgery that I would have, that I would have to endure, which was a very, very difficult surgery. Um, healing time, um, recovery, scans, three month scans after that, after surgery, um, labs, doctor visits, hospital visits, just everything that I had to endure after surgery, my mind could not fathom all that information, all that trauma that I was going to have to face in my life. Well, when I met my urologist, the first urologist who told me that I had kidney cancer, stage four, I asked him, why did I get this? And I'll never forget, he said, it's just bad luck. Well, um, 18 months after my surgery, in one of the scans that I was scheduled to have, um, the doctor saw that there were some spots in my lungs. And they kept monitoring those scans. And sure enough, after biopsy and more scans, it was definitely kidney cancer that, that had metastasized. So, um, yet again, another death sentence that I had to go through and that I had to endure and that I had to be strong for my family, for myself. Now, I have been on both sides of the spectrum. I was a caregiver for my mom, and I had to be very strong because I could not even imagine what she was going through when she was that sick knowing that she was going to perish. Well, now, I'm the patient, and my caregivers, my husband, my family, they were not as strong as I was when I was taking care of my mom. So then, I had to become the strong one for them. Now, one of my strengths <laughs> comes from running running marathons, doing physical activities. Um, I can say that my mental strength is my power. So when you run and you decide to do races, you just envision long runs, envision pain, envision heat exhaustion, envision um, body aches. Um, it's not just one mile, two miles, it's three miles, it's 26 miles. But not just that one day that you do the race for 26 miles. It's, it's a lot of training for months and months and months. For me, it was years. So imagine all, that, all those miles that I put um, my body through and all that physical stress. 
but not only physical stress, it was mental stress. Stress, but at the same time, when you have that mental stress, you gain mental mental strength. And so, I would practice self-talk. So I would think about crossing the finish line, um, seeing my seeing my friends that were waiting for me um, to get the trophy, just family that would I would see through the course, and they would cheer for me and call out my name. And so I would, I was so happy. I would just keep envisioning that moment when I would cross the finish line. And so I would recite in my mind positive, positive affirmations. I can do this. I don't have any pain. Imagine every step that you take, it's one step closer to the finish line. And that moment, every step that you, that you take, it will never come back. You might do another race, but that moment when you are running one, one mile after one mile, that will never come back. That's, that's what life is all about. Just life passes by so quickly. And so I would enjoy, I would take in all that, joy and pain too because I was in pain and I was just like oh my god this moment will never come back and so that same philosophy that I used for running being strong suppressing pain heat exhaustion all that negativity I would just suppress it out of my mind I wouldn't think about it I would say I would think about the fact that I was going to finish that race, and that I was going to be in such a high um, moment um, that I would want to do it again, and then I would do it again, and I would do it again. And I have to attribute my mental strength to, to running, to that discipline, to that dedication, to that determination. So here comes this second diagnosis. Um, metastasis stage four, and what was that my prognosis going to be? Not a good one, um, but I wasn't going to allow cancer dictate my life. I wasn't going to give in to the disease. I would say to myself that <coughs> if I could run a race, if I could endure pain, if I could endure um, having toenails fall off and, and rashes and all that, I could endure, I could endure kidney cancer. I could endure this, this new course in my life. And so I turned that bad luck phrase that my urologist told me um, years ago to good luck. So because of this disease, because of cancer, because of the experience that I have had being around patients, my mom, and being a caregiver, and also being the patient, I have, my, my, my life has changed so much. It, it's no longer a death sentence. It, it's just, it, it's, a, it's an inspiration for others. It's an inspiration to, to, to be the best I can, to show myself and to show my family, my friends, my husband, my doctors, my nurses, that I can do this. I want to make you look good. <laughs> and it's, it's very sad, it's, it's horrific, anyone that suffers from cancer, but I don't want to make it any worse. I want to make it great. I want to inspire others. I want to help them. I, I don't want them to, if you're patients, don't think that it's the end. Don't, don't think that it's a sad story, uh, a sad chapter in your lives. It, sometimes it's a blessing. Sometimes you get to know more about yourself, about your surroundings. Um, you get to appreciate life more. Um, 
the air that you breathe is probably, you feel like it's cleaner than before. You just have a second chance in life. And little pains here and there, that's, that's just a small picture. The big picture is when, when you get the treatment, when the treatment and the medicine gives you back life. And we are so fortunate. I am so fortunate to have the best doctors. Um, I'm so fortunate that UM Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center has just, it's world class um, medical care and innovative research. And Dr. Machan is one of the top researchers. And I am so lucky that I am your patient and that you care for me and Anita, you also. I thank you so much for all your love. And I am happy and grateful that I have such a great husband that helps me, that supports me, that encourages me. My family, my sister, my brother, my niece, my friends. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for loving me. And don't ever feel that you are alone. I want to say something. Because of all of this, I am living proof that you can beat cancer. I've had horrible side effects. I've had body pain. I've had all kinds of um, things that are not pleasant to experience. But because of my attitude, because of my positive positivity, I just suppress the pain. Pain is just, it's in my mind. I, I give more importance to joy, to life, to, to the crossing the finish line. For me, crossing the finish line is the cure for cancer. And I know that I will find it. Right now, I'm doing treatment, um, um, immunotherapy, and probably Dr. Roshan will speak more about the treatment that I am receiving here at, at UM Sylvester. But I don't feel any side effects at all. In fact, when I come to get my treatment every month, I really look forward to it. I know that I want to see my, my favorite nurses getting, giving, getting blood for me, <clears throat> administering the, the uh, infusion, and they come and bring me Cuban coffee, and then they just, they come and sit with me and, and tell me funny stories, and I laugh. And sometimes I have things to read, and I, I can't because they keep interrupting me all the time. <laughs> so I really enjoy just coming here and seeing those, that, those people, those, those close friends that I call that are just offering me so much. And how could I not offer them back? my love, my gratitude, and, and just my happiness, and telling them that I'm okay, I'm okay. Um, so I would like to share one last thing with you. You will never know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice that you have. So thank you. Raquel's story is a story of inspiration, okay? And uh, uh, what, what we can say with uh, those of us who uh, treat patients with cancer and with kidney cancer, okay? Thanks to the research and thanks to the new advances in the treatments, okay? Thankfully, we're having more stories like that, like Raquel, okay? I can say, for example, that Raquel uh, uh, is a runner She's a, a great runner. This is her second year where she participated in the DCC running the 5K. And, uh, and she did great. She did great and she is helping raise funds for cancer research as well. And uh, I completely agree that she's a living proof that um, with uh, hard work uh, and with a good attitude, okay, we can move forward. And this is what we like, well, what we would like for all our patients. 
Raquel, you have been both a caregiver and a patient. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. You have been both a caregiver and a patient uh, uh, for like in cancer. What, uh, what would you say to, to caregivers? It's an important aspect in, like in, in the day-to-day -day life when you are seeing your family member uh, enduring side effects and suffering from side effects, okay? Because many times, family members want to help their family, right? And uh, uh, they want to do everything they can to, so to, so to help them. And sometimes, as many of us with different situations say, you know, uh, we don't know what to do, right? So what type of advice would you give uh, caregivers? Like now that you have the experience as a caregiver and as a patient. Um, well, as a caregiver, I would just uh, encourage them to be kind, to be patient, to be understanding. In my experience, I did a lot of research about the type of cancer that my mom had, the side effects, um, and, and I just, I, I knew medically what was going on in her body, but at the same time, um, separate from that, <clears throat> I was very, very close with her, giving her all my love, attention, trying to prepare things for her, anticipate what she might need, um, make things easier for her when she couldn't walk, when uh, she had to get up and go to the bathroom, or when she, had some, when she needed to eat something, I would prepare it for her. Basically, just you cannot do anything. You cannot fix the, anything for them. You cannot take away the disease. But just by being there, by being supportive, by showing them that you are there, um, make them laugh, watch television with them, tell them stories, um, read a book, just take her out, take them out for a walk if you can, um, open the window, breathe some fresh air, watch movies, things that are funny. Um, just being, being there, offering your love, your support, and your understanding, even though they will tell you that you don't know what it feels like because you're not in their shoes. And you will never know what it's like to be in their shoes. I happen to know because I'm on the other side. I, I was a caregiver and now I'm the patient. But don't get upset if they tell you that you don't know what you're saying or that they don't, you don't know what they feel. You tell them, yes, exactly. I don't know what it feels to be in your shoes. But all I know is that I am here and I am not going to leave you alone and I am going to support you every step of the way. I will be there with you for anything that you need, treatments, visits, everything. I'll do anything for you. And we just have to not be selfish and um, think that they're hurting us by not allowing us to help them. It's not about you, it's about them. And all you can do is show them kindness, understanding, and show them love. That's what Thank I you. Thank you, you very much. Yeah. I, I completely share Raquel's words. And uh, 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 what, what she's saying is so true. What she's saying is so true. Uh, because many times we, we, see, we see the patients and we see the families, and the families want to do whatever they can, and they feel desperate to help, and that can lead to frustration and anger and misunderstandings, right? Sometimes, okay, and this is a very powerful tool, okay, when we are seeing patients who are suffering, we are the family members, sometimes the patients because we know that sometimes we cannot fix everything. Sometimes what patients need and what patients want is understanding and validation, okay? Just to say, I'm here with you, okay? I can understand how hard this must be, and I'm here with you, okay? 
If you want to talk, if you want to be alone, if you want to sleep, I'm here with you. Uh, and, that, and that is important. We, we wish we could fix everything, even doctors. We, we cannot fix everything, but we can be with you. And that's also another of the important missions of, of the doctors and our incredible nurses who, who, who help us, okay? We are uh, on time and on schedule, which is great. Uh, uh, I would like to now introduce you to a very good uh, friend of mine and colleague, uh, Dr. Janaki Sharma. She's uh, a, an assistant professor of medicine uh, at the Division of Medical Oncology. She is also a GU oncologist, meaning a medical oncologist who does cancers of the urinary tract, including kidney cancer. And she's going to talk about uh, uh, like the basics of kidney cancer. What is kidney cancer? Raquel asked her initial questions to, to the doctor, what is kidney cancer? Why do I have it? So this type of information, which we usually discuss with the patients the first time we see them, okay, in the small time that we have for the visits, are very important questions, okay? And, and that's why we decided to include this talk about what is kidney cancer uh, in today's meeting. Dr. Sharma. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to the Judy Nicholson Kidney Cancer Foundation and to Dr. Mershon for giving me this opportunity to speak. This was actually the last time I spoke at an in-person conference at Miami, and it was actually the first conference I ever presented at in Miami, and it holds a very special place in my heart. I also really relish this opportunity to give you guys a basic overview of kidney cancer, this super important organ of the kidney, and how cancer can develop here and what we can do about it. I want to start with just very basic thoughts, right? So every person has two kidneys when they're born. And I, I say every person, but I mean most people. Some people are born with only one kidney. Some people altruistically donate a kidney, or some people, one of their kidneys stops functioning during their lifetime. But the good news is, is that each kidney functions independently, and so you can live a perfectly normal life with just one kidney. The kidneys are each about the size of a fist. They're located above your waist, closer to the back than the front, on either side of your spine. The main function of the kidneys is to filter your blood and to remove impurities, to control your blood pressure, to balance your salt levels. And kidneys also secrete hormones that control these things. So during the course of your kidney cancer journey, you'll not only hear about the kidneys, you'll also hear about two things called adrenal glands. These are two little organs that sit right above your kidneys on either side. They're not really implicated in kidney cancer, but patients see them a lot on scans. They control your hormone levels. They help control your blood pressure as well. And so you may be reading about them when you get a scan, although they're not really that relevant to today's talks. Every day, your kidney filters all the blood in your body 60 times. That's equivalent to 50 gallons of liquid going through something the size of a fist. From those 50 gallons of liquid, your kidneys take out all the toxins and impurities, take out the excess salt that you may have consumed that day, mixes it with some water to control the levels of hydration in your body, and it produces about a gallon of urine a day, which you expel from your body. Unfortunately, from normal kidneys, sometimes people develop kidney cancer. Cancer at its simplistic level is just abnormal cells growing abnormally. And sometimes they start to grow out of control. Those growing cells conglomerate together and they form tumors. You can have benign tumors or malignant tumors. Benign tumors are cells that are growing abnormally, but they don't have the ability to spread. And so oftentimes we just ignore them or we remove them. We don't really worry about them. Malignant tumors are those same kind of cells growing abnormally, but they have the potential to spread to other parts of the body, causing problems. And that's where we come in. So the obvious question now is, how do normal cells turn into cancer cells? So most of your body, actually I should say all of your body, is made up of cells. Cells are the smallest living unit that comprises the functioning of our body. And throughout our lives, our cells will grow reproduce and divide, and then die. That's just normal. Sometimes, however, 
actually all the time, when our cells are growing and dividing, they may pick up slightly different characteristics. And in scientific terms, we call those characteristics mutations. And developing mutations is just a normal part of our cells maintaining our body. Most of the mutations or characteristics that our cells get when they're growing and dividing are minor, and they don't really cause major changes in the way our body functions. Sometimes when cells are growing, they develop mutations that are so major that our body immediately recognizes that this cell is gonna be a problem, and it takes that cell out of our body. However, the problem comes up when over time, a cell acquires a couple of small mutations that allow it to grow unchecked without any concern for what the rest of the body is doing. Eventually, if those cells continue to grow unchecked, they turn into a tumor. And eventually, if that tumor continues to grow, it can form its own blood supply in a process called angiogenesis. It can spread locally, invading other organs nearby, or it can spread far away using the blood system to hitch a ride, or using something called the lymphatic system to hitch a ride. I like to think of the lymphatic system as the drainage system of the body. It helps remove the impurities and balance the fluid levels throughout your body. And that's why in cancers, you'll often hear talk about lymph nodes and whether it's spread to the lymph nodes or not. Because lymph nodes are the drainage sites of many organs. And so cancer cells can hitch a ride through the lymphatic system, causing the lymph nodes to look larger, maybe causing some cancer cells to be in some of those lymph nodes, and then use that to spread to other parts of the body. So when it does that, it forms tumors outside of the kidney. These new tumors are called metastases. So metastases are basically just a tumor that's growing somewhere else, not where it started. And I think that this is a really challenging concept for some patients because when you go to a doctor and they tell you, I have bad news, you have cancer in your kidney, and you have tumors in your liver, the inclination is to think, oh my gosh, I have cancer in my kidney and cancer in my liver. But the truth of the matter is, if we were to take a sample of those tumors in your liver, they're exactly the same as the tumors in your kidney. And the implication of that is that when I give a treatment to my patients to try and treat their kidney cancer, it works on all the tumors in their body that came from that kidney cancer. It's all the same kind of cancer. It's just sitting in different areas, which is why we call them metastases. And now, while kidney cancer can spread anywhere, it has some preferred spots. Most of the time, the metastases are seen in the lungs or the bones. Sometimes, and rare, we can see it in the brain, the liver, and the pancreas. And if that wasn't complicated enough, you can have different kinds of kidney cancer. So the most common kind, which is what most of us will be talking about today, is called renal cell carcinoma. About 85% of the tumors that are seen in the kidney are renal cell carcinoma, and they develop from the cells in the kidney's filtration system. But you can also get something called urothelial carcinoma, which is more like a bladder cancer. And so patients that have urothelial carcinoma in their kidney will often get treated with similar drugs like we use for bladder cancer. And so even though you have kidney cancer, it looks more like a bladder cancer. There are also, you can get sarcomas, lymphomas, neuroendocrine tumors, and they're all treated differently, which is why it's really important for your doctors to get an accurate diagnosis of what kind of tumor you have in your kidney. And so the way that we find this out as physicians is we use a branch of science called pathology. Pathology allows us to look at the details of the cells that are forming your tumors and figure out what kind of cancer it is. So the way this process works is patients will get a biopsy. Sometimes we'll biopsy your, tumor, your kidney tumor. Sometimes we'll biopsy one of the sites of the metastasis, usually using a needle to take out a little collection of cells. That little collection of cells is sliced up and looked at under a microscope. They apply some special stains to it to catch certain details of the cancer, sometimes to pick up on some of those mutations that actually caused the cancer in the first place. And on this slide on the left, you see what looks like a normal kidney specimen. It's organized into nice little circles. Um, and on the right, you see a clear cell carcinoma. It's disorganized, the cells are very tightly packed, and pathologists can use all this information to tell you whether you have clear cell cancer or urothelial cancer or some other type altogether. 
Adding to this, even within clear cell carcinoma, there are over 30 different subtypes. Sorry, even within kidney RCC, renal cell carcinoma, there are over 30 different subtypes. The most common kind is clear cell, and clear cell has varying degrees of aggressiveness. The less common kind, although still present in about 10 to 15 percent of cases, is papillary. Again, most of the treatment discussions that you'll hear about today are for clear cell renal cell carcinoma, or clear cell RCC. We have the most data to guide treatment for this disease. There are some smaller studies looking at how we should specially treat papillary RCC, but there is less information available about it. And so if you have a kidney cancer that's not clear cell, your doctor may be even more interested in putting you in something like a clinical trial to test out newer available treatment options and help guide science in the future. Now that we've talked about how kidney cancer develops and a little bit about the kidneys, I think it's important to bring up the question that I get asked probably second most often, which is, how did I get kidney cancer? And this is one of the hardest questions for me to answer because most of the time the answer is I don't know. Aside from the small number of patients that come in with familial genetic syndromes, some of which are listed here, most of the time we don't know exactly why a patient had developed kidney cancer. There are some things called risk factors, which are associated with a slightly higher chance of having kidney cancer. Those include smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, a family history, certain toxic chemicals, um, gender, males are slightly more common than females, and race, it's slightly more common in black men. But even with these risk factors, we don't know why exactly one of these risk factors, or if, if you have this risk factor, you're actually going to develop kidney cancer. And even if you have high blood pressure and it's well controlled, it doesn't actually change the risk. So there's a lot of things about these risk factors that we don't understand, but it is something that we keep track of and we study and hopefully we'll know more about how these are contributing to kidney cancer in the future. But even if that has you worried, you need to know that kidney cancer is not that common. Fewer than one in 5,000 people are diagnosed with kidney cancer in the U.S. every year. And it's a very treatable disease. Most people are diagnosed with early stage disease, and they have minimal to no symptoms. As Dr. Gonzalo pointed out, a lot of times, and as he showed in one of his cases, it's diagnosed what we call incidentally. And what that means is you may go to your doctor with some stomach pain, your doctor's worried that you have appendicitis, and so they do a CAT scan. Thankfully, your CAT scan doesn't show any appendicitis, but they see a small two centimeter tumor on your liver, and they don't know what it is. And then you ensue, you get a workup, and that's oftentimes how kidney cancer is diagnosed and how you get referred to Dr. Gonzalo to have it removed. If you have a more advanced stage of kidney cancer, you might develop certain symptoms. You might notice blood in your urine or hematuria. You might have flank pain or back pain. You might have fevers, night sweats, weight loss. And sometimes if the kidney cancer has spread to other parts of the body, you might get symptoms from the area where it's spread to. For instance, patients that have kidney cancer in their brain may get chronic severe headaches every night. After we know that you have kidney cancer or we have suspicions that you have kidney cancer, we need to figure out how advanced it is. The way that we do that is something called staging. So staging helps doctors decide on treatment and also give a rough idea of how well you're expected to do with the disease. The primary way in which we do staging is something called the TNM system. And it's actually fairly intuitive. T stands for tumor. And your tumor is assigned a number from one to four, and it's based upon the size of the tumor, how big it is, where it's invading. The next, the N, is stands for lymph nodes. And that's the number of lymph nodes, how far away they are from your primary tumor. Higher numbers in N mean more lymph nodes, mean more aggressive disease. And the M stands for metastases. <coughs> and that's simply a one or a zero. You have metastases or you don't. And different combinations of T, N, and M lead to the different stages. And that's why you may be hearing stage one, two, three, or four. The stages in general mean this. Stage one is small tumors that haven't spread anywhere else. Stage two is kind of larger tumors that still haven't spread anywhere else. Stage three is just medium-sized tumors, but they involve the lymph nodes, or they're starting to breach the kidney walls. And stage four is any tumor that has spread beyond the kidney to another site or metastases. 
Staging can be clinical, meaning that we base the staging off scans and our physical exam. And if that's the case, you'll see a tiny little C in front of your staging numbers. Or it can be pathological, which means you've had a surgery done and we know definitively what structures it invades and how big the tumor is. If you've had a surgery done and your doctor provides you with your staging, you'll see a little P in front of that T and N and M numbers. <coughs> the way we do staging is typically done with the assistance of CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, and bone scans. We don't do all the tests for everyone. Your doctor will guide you on what is the best test for your type of kidney cancer and for the symptoms that you present with. Depending on what the staging shows, your treatment options are different. Stage 1, 2, and 3 renal cell carcinomas are almost always treated with surgery, and they're frequently referred to as localized or locally advanced disease. Sometimes patients after the time of surgery may get additional IV treatment before or after surgery, and that's called neoadjuvant or adjuvant treatment. If you have stage 4 disease or metastatic disease, your disease is usually stratified further based on risk factors and based on looking at factors in your blood, how functional you are, your strength levels, doctors can tell us whether you're either poor risk, intermediate risk, or favorable risk. And that is used to guide treatment options. It's also used to give us rough estimates of how patients with similar risk factors did in the past. I will conclude with a brief overview of treatment of kidney cancer. Most of my colleagues will be covering that in more detail today. But if you have localized kidney cancer, stage 1, 2, or 3, treatment, like Dr. Gonzalo said, is almost always surgery, removing the whole kidney or part of the kidney. And the good news is you can live a perfectly normal life with just one kidney. And like I said earlier, some patients with higher risk disease may get more treatments after the surgery to prevent the disease from coming back. You may also hear about other options like thermal ablation or active surveillance, both of which are reasonable options to control small tumors, which your surgeon or your medical oncologist can discuss with you. If you have stage four disease or metastatic kidney cancer, in general, we say the disease is not curable. But patients can experience long remissions lasting for many years, and treatment options are constantly evolving such that with the use of immunotherapy, patients can be disease-free and treatment-free for many years despite having metastatic disease. The treatment is called systemic therapy. And systemic therapy basically means that we give you a treatment, either in your mouth, through pills, or in your veins, through IV treatments, that are designed to attack all of the tumors in your body at the same time. Your doctor may combine multiple systemic therapies at the same time to increase your chances of responding and to prolong the amount of time that you respond. Once you have metastatic disease, most patients will need to be on some kind of treatment for the majority of the rest of their lives. Having to switch treatments when one treatment stops working is totally normal. It's not a failure on your part or your doctor's part if you have to go through multiple treatments throughout your kidney cancer journey. Systemic therapy for metastatic disease kind of falls into one of two categories. And I put this here because it mostly to show you guys that we have many available drugs. And we use multiple combinations of these drugs to give you the best possible care and to prolong life and prevent kidney cancer recurrence for as long as possible. My colleagues are going to cover all of this in more details and clinical trial options. Thank you again for this opportunity to present, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Incredible presentation. Uh, I think I, I, when I hear you talking, I see some ideas are coming to my mind, like, for example, creating a little video to give to all our patients who come for the first time to learn about kidney cancer. What do you guys think? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So we'll talk, we'll talk to, to the cancer center leadership to see if we can do that. I think that's going to be great. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions from the audience? All right. So it, it's kind of the case with all cancers, right? You, your cancer starts in one organ, and then somehow it acquires a series of mutations 
that allow it to travel to another organ that maybe has some similar characteristics or something favorable that allows that cancer to hide out there. And then over time, it grows in that organ. And that's why you know, certain cancers spread to certain places. Um, there's, it's, it's specific to each different kind of cancer. What are the mutations that allow them to spread? Um, and some of it we know, but a lot of it we still don't know. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Um, we hear a lot of information about the, the dimension about the, you have a lot of data working around the old treatment on, and everybody is different. How University of Miami is working with the uh, technology involved in the data management, like uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence? How do you guys are working, joining with the technology players like Google, Microsoft, IBM? We heard the last day quantum computing, there is exponential uh, uh, you know, results about the technology can help uh, the, the cancer cure. How, how do you guys think uh, is, is the technology and how it you're doing the, this, uh, you know, get together to, to make it uh, effort stronger to the, this data management really works against the cancer. Yeah, sure. So that's actually a great question um, because that's really the forefront of where the technology is heading. The University of Miami has several ongoing collaborations. Um, some with IBM Watson looking at AI in the use of medical diagnosis. There's another really interesting project um, pairing up engineers from the University of Miami with tumor biologists looking at how their actual structural changes in the way that cells organize themselves that contribute to cancer growth and how we can target that. In terms of kidney cancer specifically, I am not doing anything in that area, um, but I think Dr. Mershon might be able to talk about some of the projects that he's working on in databases built out to look at kidney cancer. Yes, uh, that's a great question, and I think that is where the future will, will take us. Um, here at, at UM, we are doing several different uh, databases, both clinical and also uh, computational and molecular. Uh, clinical, we are creating a very, very large database for all our patients who had kidney cancer in the last 10 years. And we have a lot of patients, like more than 600 patients, which basically is a reflection of our experience and expertise in kidney cancer that people come to UM to treat and to be evaluated for kidney cancer. Also, there's databases that Dr. Gonzalo is doing for patients who had surgery, which is probably thousands of patients, right? We have uh, databases with tumor bands uh, where we are keeping pathology slides in order to do future studies. In terms of bioinformatics, okay, we have very, very, uh, a high level of expertise by the scientists at UM. Okay? Some of those are working with our laboratory, but with Valerie and I, we're basically uh, are experts in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and what we are trying to do is we're trying to basically gather the molecular information that we can get from tumors doing specific analysis of the DNA or the RNA, and then try to find a, a mechanism by which the tumors may become resistant, and also to uh, try to identify vulnerabilities, okay, where we can hit the cancer with new targeted agents. Okay, all of that basically is only possible due to research. Okay, which is another important take message here from this meeting: research can cure cancer, and unfortunately, kidney cancer research is underfunded. There's not as much funding for cancer research as it is for breast cancer or pancreatic cancer, which is less common than, than kidney cancer and as uh, lethal as kidney cancer. Okay, so, and that's what we always do, uh, 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 try to apply for grants from the NCI, which also are sometimes difficult to get. We do fundraising that like we did at DCC this time Okay, where Raquel and other patients were participating, and that helps us. And we all always uh, 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 ask for help and support through the, through the development office at the Cancer Center, and that really will help us help our patients by bringing the new cures. Okay, any other questions? 
Yeah. Uh, just a quick question regarding the, uh, the different methodologies for treating it, mm -hmm. uh, the cancer. Um, how, what role does the FDA play in trying out different combinations of the different therapies or immunotherapy, whatever approach is being used? How does the FDA uh, involve itself and is, is, it, is it helpful or is it not helpful or what, what is your kind of assessment as far as that? So I think the FDA is actually immensely helpful for us. Obviously, they produce some regulatory challenges as well. And if it was the Wild West, we would love to just you know, give our patients whatever drugs we wanted to and see what happens. Um, but they're a valuable source of information. When we're, so the way new combinations get approved is that we run a clinical trial looking at this new combination in X number of patients. And before we run that clinical trial, we need to get approval from the FDA. And so they're a valuable source of information on what are the safety risks with this combination to patients? Why are you choosing to use it in these patients, this now? And they challenge us and ask us these questions. And if we provide solid answers, we can move forward with the clinical trial. And then if the clinical trial provides good data showing that the combination is efficacious, we go back to the FDA looking for approval. And so the interplay is, is complex, but I think also rewarding for patients in particular because it's another body of oversight allowing the newest treatments to move forward quickly. So to dovetail to that question, who decides what protocols are used? Um, can you expand a little so, bit? Uh, a combination of immunotherapy with another your last slide with a different medicines that are standard of care protocol. Yeah. Standard of care protocol. So science begins in the lab right? And a scientist finds a new drug and they test it out on kidney cancer cells and it works. And then they look and figure out why does it work? And then they try it out in patients and it works again, right? In the first couple of patients. And then you try it out on more patients. And then they go back to the lab with the data from those patients and they think about what, make, make, what might make that drug work better. And they maybe find another drug that they can combine with that. And so then they test that combination in cells. And then it works in cells, so then we test it in animals. And then it works in animals, and we test it in humans. And so it's a constant uh, reiterative process where we find something that works for patients, and then we go back to the laboratory and see if we can make it better. And so it's the scientists that initially identify some combination. And there are some people like Dr. Mershon, who is both a clinician and a scientist. And so then, they identify a combination that maybe they think is going to work in theory, and then if it does work, they move it forward. And then, because Dr. Mershon plays both roles, he can decide for himself. But for me, who I'm primarily a clinician, a scientist will come to me and suggest something, and then I will look at the information and see if I think it's going to work in patients. And if it is, then I might write the clinical trial, go to the FDA for approval to run the clinical trial, and try it out. And if it works, it keeps going down the process. So, did you, so would you say that today, and maybe this question is for you, Dr. Marchan, uh, more immunotherapies being used than other types of medicine? Because the evolution of immunotherapy, from what I've read, is prevalent in not just this type of cancer, but other cancers. Hmm. So, you see the future as more or more emphasis being put on using immunotherapy as opposed to other types of medicine? I, so I think that's a great question. I think in kidney cancer we've had you know, remarkable improvements in patient care and survival with the use of immunotherapy. Um, but the field is developing in many different directions, right? There are, we're discovering new mutations all the time that we can target specifically. And that produces good treatments that have even fewer side effects and perhaps prolonged benefit. So yes, I do think immunotherapy is, is part of the way forward, but there are certainly several other novel therapies that we continue to explore, um, which may one day overtake immunotherapy. We're going to move uh, to the next one for now with Dr. Mark Gonzalgo. Dr. Gonzalgo is a dear friend of mine we are partners with many, many patients uh, with uh, kidney cancer, and he uh, is uh, 
one of the best urologists in the world, okay? He's gonna share with you his experience in the surgical options for kidney cancer. Dr. Gonzalo. Thank you all for being here. I think this is wonderful for us to be in person. And again, hello to everyone out there online. Uh, I wanna keep on time as well. I'll try to make sure I look at the clock and, and, and make sure we're uh, sticking to the agenda. But um, today I'm gonna focus on really the surgical approaches uh, for renal cell carcinoma. Uh, it's gonna be very focused on that since I'm a surgeon a urologist here at the DeSaiseti uh, Urology Institute at Sylvester and University of Miami. So when we talk about surgical technique, it certainly has evolved uh, over the uh, many years. We know of the open or traditional surgery that uh, we can do for kidney cancer. Uh, and uh, in the 1990s, that was really the first introduction of minimally invasive approaches, or what we know as laparoscopic approaches for kidney cancer. And then many of you have now probably heard of uh, you know, robotic surgery or robotic approaches uh, for kidney cancer, and that uh, happened maybe in the early uh, 2000s. This has definitely mirrored uh, the developments with surgical technology, because we live in a world now that's dominated by technology in all aspects, and, and that's not uh, limited to our iPhones or what we do uh, now online with uh, AI, but also extends to how we do surgery and how we try to always strive to improve uh, treatment of patients uh, with kidney cancer. And we know with open surgery, we work with our hands. With laparoscopic surgery, we also work with our hands, but the tools by which we uh, do the operation are somewhat different, and this is an example of uh, some of the laparoscopic equipments. One of the major differences between what we talk about laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery are the instruments. This is an example of robotic uh, instruments that are a little bit more advanced, not only uh, with how they move, but also with the type of uh, electric uh, technology uh, that can be introduced to these to help make the surgeries uh, better uh, for patients. I think one of the biggest uh, differences between robotic surgery and traditional surgery, as you can see here in the center, that's really where the robot instruments are attached to the patient in order to perform the kidney surgery safely. And myself as a surgeon would sit at what's called the console, which is on the right side of the screen uh, over here. And so that uh, in and of itself is different than what we are usually um, uh, used to when we do uh, traditional surgery, whether it's open or laparoscopic. This video here shows one of the older units, but that is how the robot uh, interfaces with the patient. And I think one of the biggest advances with robotic surgery is the ability to do the operation uh, in three dimensions. Because when you're doing the surgery laparoscopically, you're looking on like a computer monitor, and that's two dimensions. This video also shows how the instruments for the surgery uh, can be moved with greater degrees of freedom, which is different from a laparoscopic surgery. And I think one of the advances as well is the ability to perform this type of manipulation with the needles and sutures that we utilize uh, during uh, our surgical cases. You know, the University of Miami uh, has the longest experience with the Da Vinci XI robot in the world. We were the first academic center in the United States, or actually worldwide, uh, to begin to use Da Vinci XI uh, here at Sylvester, and that was back in 2014. And so you can see uh, this is the part of the robot uh, that will uh, move the instruments and attach to the patient. Again, minimally invasive, so we don't have to make uh, a big incision uh, anymore. Uh, you know, we do have to still make small incisions, that's why it's called minimally invasive surgery, but again, this leads to uh, better recovery uh, and less pain uh, for the patients afterwards. I think Dr. Sharma is going to talk about, you know, what is kidney cancer and uh, basics uh, about understanding the disease, but I think at least during a surgery talk, it's important to understand at least uh, at the basic level that there are different stages of cancer different stages of kidney tumors, and each stage will uh, influence the type of surgery uh, that's going to be performed. And so typically for patients with lower stage disease, uh, you know, stage one tumors, for example, and some stage two tumors, we as surgeons can do what's called a partial nephrectomy. That's basically focusing on trying to remove the tumor while trying to preserve as much kidney as possible. When tumors start 
getting larger, uh, stage three tumors or stage four, and certainly some stage two tumors, we talk about radical nephrectomy, which is total removal of the tumor uh, as well as the kidney. And so there are a lot of variables that you need to consider when deciding what is best for the patient. Uh, I think there are tumor considerations. And just like real estate, the location of the tumor in the kidney can play a big part on whether or not you need to do a partial versus a radical nephrectomy, as well as the size of the tumor. So I wanted to run through a few cases. I think you'll find this interesting from a surgery standpoint to demonstrate what uh, goes into uh, operations for patients uh, with kidney cancer. And this is a patient, for example, who may have gone to the emergency room because they see blood in the urine. Uh, that's referred to as hematuria uh, from a medical standpoint. And while they're in the emergency room, they'll frequently get a CT scan. And that scan shows a 10 centimeter mass in the left kidney. Now, when we go ahead uh, with removal of this, this is a fairly large tumor. This can be done via an open approach or a laparoscopic approach or a robotic approach. As I said, there are many factors that need to be taken into consideration. Every patient is different. Every surgeon is different. But uh, we do this uh, frequently now with a robotic approach. So on the right side of the screen here, you'll see in this part of the left kidney is uh, an area that is a little more gray. Uh, this represents a large uh, kidney tumor uh, for this kidney. So the decision was made at this point uh, for this particular patient and most appropriate to undergo what's called uh, a radical nephrectomy or total removal of the kidney. A lot of people think from a surgical standpoint, you may just go in there and take out the kidney. Well, it's not as easy as that. Remember, the kidneys receive about 25% of your blood supply every minute. So what goes into removing the kidney is really uh, safely controlling the blood supply to that kidney. And we do this essentially with robotic stapling devices. Uh, that can be used uh, obviously after manipulation and we've taken the renal artery on this kidney here we've isolated what's known as the renal vein which is the big vein that drains the blood from the kidney and really after removing the renal artery and renal vein as well as the surrounding tissues we're able to remove this tumor as well as the whole kidney and that's called a radical nephrectomy I think the video here makes it look a little easier than is actually done. Uh, it simplifies it some bit, uh, but I want at least you to have some understanding uh, between the difference of a radical or a partial nephrectomy. I think one of the biggest benefits for minimally invasive surgery, whether it's laparoscopic or robotic, is the recovery. So even with a patient having this type of surgery, small incisions, they'll typically go home one day after surgery. And then for a tumor like this, the patient's going to meet typically with a medical oncologist such as Dr. Mershan or Dr. Sharma or Dr. Belusik, I think, who's coming here later uh, to discuss what would be the most appropriate treatment. Because again, in many situations, surgery may just be one component of what we call a multidisciplinary approach to treating the disease. So you're going to be meeting with a bunch of specialists, uh, for example, here at Sylvester, to best, management, uh, to best manage uh, your condition. And so options for this uh, type of treatment could include surveillance, which is just watching it, um, things perhaps like immunotherapy uh, or enrollment in a clinical trial. I show this to focus now maybe on the smaller tumors. These are clinical T1 renal masses. This is the American Neurological Association guidelines. You don't need to memorize it. It can be quite confusing. I think the main point of this I've highlighted is that for patients who may have those smaller type of tumors, uh, we can most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time do what's called a partial nephrectomy uh, on the kidney. So trying to remove the tumor, but preserving as much kidney as possible for the benefit of the patient. And our motivation to do that was uh, really started in part by several studies, but one of the earliest uh, in the mid-2000s done at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, looking at over 600 patients who had either a radical or a partial nephrectomy. And this graph shows you just if you look at the top, uh, again, you don't need to know all of the details, but the end result of this study showed that patients who had a partial nephrectomy did much better than patients who had a radical nephrectomy in terms of their overall renal function long term. So that these patients who had a partial nephrectomy were less likely to develop chronic renal disease or renal insufficiency. So again, that's one of the benefits of just removing only the tumor while trying to preserve as much kidney as possible. And I think that makes sense. As I mentioned, it's perfectly acceptable to do any approach for the kidney tumor depending on the patient and the surgeon. Uh, we looked at this trend uh, nationwide a few years ago 
uh, over 20,000 patients. And it's interesting, if you look at use of either robotic or open uh, partial nephrectomy, by the year uh, 2013, which is now over a decade ago, uh, the, majority of robotic, uh, the majority of partial nephrectomy cases in the United States uh, were now uh, being performed minimally invasive or robotically compared to the traditional approach. And I'm sure that now in 2023, uh, this black uh, bar, which represents a robotic approach, would be much higher. So let's look at a patient now who has a smaller tumor. This time, uh, this was accidentally discovered. Again, a lot of these smaller renal masses are going to be discovered when someone goes to the emergency room because they have maybe an abdominal pain or a back pain or just something doesn't feel quite right. And it's almost discovered by accident. A lot of the tumors of this size actually don't have any symptoms associated with it. And so I think with uh, our imaging uh, capability with CT scans, uh, we are picking up on these at a much earlier stage. As I mentioned, Location of the tumor is quite important, so we use these terms like superior, which is really towards the top of the kidney, or posterior lateral, which is merely more to behind or the side of the kidney. All of these things are taken into consideration uh, regarding what is the best surgery ultimately to do for the kidney. So this is a CAT scan of a patient uh, showing a tumor uh, that's about three centimeters here, and you can see it's on what we call the side of the kidney. Part of this is actually poking out, so you're going to see a bulge in this video. So now we're looking at the right kidney. And again, in order to get to the tumor, we have to manipulate a bunch of tissues. Uh, the kidney is covered in what's known as fat or perinephric fat. And again, here in this patient, you see the vessels, large pulsations of the renal artery, the renal vein. And in this case, the patient actually has two renal veins uh, and a few renal arteries. At the top of the screen, you can see this bulge here, this round structure, which is the tumor. As I mentioned, what's important in a partial nephrectomy, we have to uh, make sure we have good control of the blood supply to the kidney before actually cutting out the tumor, and that's shown here. We use clips to um, basically control the inflow of the blood to the kidney, and in some cases we stop the outflow, as shown here. This is a clip going over the renal vein. Once this is done, then we'll go ahead and begin to cut out the tumor, uh, and that's shown here. This instrument here is a suction device at the bottom of the screen, and that's controlled by the assistant that's sitting at the bedside. So whether it's surgery or treatment after kidney tumors, it's not just any uh, one individual, uh, but it's a team of physicians, nurses, support staff that are really critical and I think are all important in trying to provide the best care we can for our patients. So you can see I've cut out the tumor, um, and that's at top. Once it's out, we will typically place it into a bag which is almost like a small Ziploc bag to contain everything soon uh, thereafter. Right now, I'll just put it to the side. But we'll have to close this area of the kidney that was cut on, um, and that's done with suture. And you can see how with the robotic instruments, that's uh, much more easily done uh, than with just pure laparoscopic uh, instruments. And then if you look at what's left of the kidney here uh, and what has been cut out, you, know, it's, uh, you can see that greater than 90%, probably 95% of the kidney is still intact and will recover function after the surgery. So I think that's one of the biggest benefits, as I said, of doing a partial nephrectomy uh, for a patient uh, whenever possible. Uh, and again, that's typically associated when the tumors are lower stage. Again, this patient will typically go home one day after surgery. Uh, and for T1 tumors, or those at lower stage, uh, typically they will uh, be able to undergo surveillance um, uh, without any need for further treatment, and surgery can be uh, curative uh, in that sense in many uh, situations. So this again is a uh, patient partial nephrectomy uh, approach, a smaller side, but this time it's different. This tumor is what we call hyalur, or very close to the vessels, or endophytic, which is deep inside the kidney. And you'll see on these CAT scans here uh, the difference between this tumor, which is completely buried inside the kidney. If actually, if you were to look at the kidney, you wouldn't even be able to, from the outside, you wouldn't be able to tell there was actually a tumor inside that kidney. Uh, and again, uh, depending on patient, uh, the patient uh, or the surgeon, uh, I think some people may uh, do a radical or complete removal of the kidney here because of the complexity of doing a partial. And really, uh, sometimes I'll say this is in the heart of the kidney. So again, this would represent a very complex partial nephrectomy uh, because of the location. Uh, but we did the partial. And again, I don't show all the steps that I've shown before. But essentially, if I'm able to get to the point of removing the tumor, which is there, you can see how much kidney uh, that we can preserve 
uh, and then provide a future function uh, for that patient. And again, they'll do very well with very quick recovery uh, and hopefully uh, no need uh, for treatment. Now, the last case presentation I want to show is something that, again, I think we're proud of here uh, at Sylvester uh, and UM in terms of trying to advance uh, surgical techniques. Uh, this is a patient who came in uh, with a four centimeter uh, fat containing kidney tumor. Now, because of some of the characteristics, remember not all tumors are malignant. Uh, some can be benign. And so there was a very high probability, um, even in terms of trying to uh, manage this patient, that this was going to be a benign tumor. But there was a problem with this. Even though the tumor itself wasn't very large, it did have a, what's called a tumor thrombus or an extension of the tumor, uh, which can happen typically with larger tumors that can go into the renal vein, as shown here on the bottom left. Uh, in the middle, this is really where this tumor sat in the sense that the thrombus was going not just into the renal vein, but going into the inferior vena cava, which is the largest vein in our body. It wasn't going quite up as high as this as shown in the picture, but it was still sticking into the renal vein. And then there are some tumors that we know uh, when they get more advanced that can go into the renal vein, uh, into the inferior vena cava, and some can even uh, go all the way up to the heart in terms of the tumor thrombus. So once you start getting to these more complex cases, uh, that's where we're talking about involvement of even more uh, specialists, um, medical oncologists, even perhaps before surgery to help shrink the tumor, and then surgeons obviously to remove the tumor. So when this patient was seen, uh, initially, she was told that uh, because of the tumor thrombus uh, that you would have to uh, remove and do a radical nephrectomy, um, which is typically the case. Uh, we thought it as an opportunity to help the patient um, and see if a partial nephrectomy uh, could be performed for this. Again, primarily because we had a very high suspicion that this was a benign tumor. And you can see here uh, the tumors, main tumor is here outlined in black on the CT scan. Um, with the extension of the tumor thrombus starting to poke into that renal vein. And then on the MRI, this shows you here again, the tumor here with extension of the tumor thrombus going all the way up and poking into that inferior vena cava. I think the other thing too about robotic surgery is that we have tremendous visualization. As I said, it's in three dimensions. Magnification is excellent. And again, from an anatomical standpoint, this is that inferior vena cava. This is the renal vein. This is the renal artery, and the kidney is up here. And you can see here this light yellow. This is that tumor thrombus that's actually growing from inside the kidney out into this renal vein and starting to poke into that inferior vena cava. And frequently, this is dealt with with an open incision. This is sped up here, this video showing isolation of the renal vein. We often can use intraoperative ultrasound. So in this case, you're, you're, you saw that there to, tr to help try to identify and localize the tumor, because sometimes you can't see the tumor from the outside. Uh, we use a, a clips and uh, additional techniques to help uh, mobilize that tumor. And you'll see here, I'm cutting out the tumor, and this yellow, uh, yellowish substance that you see here is actually that tumor thrombus. And you'll see I'm going to pull it out of that renal vein and in inferior vena cava. So we're able to remove that out. Once that tumor is out, um, you know, suture everything together, uh, including the vein as well as the kidney. And again, this woman uh, in this case was able to have about 70% uh, you know, of her kidney uh, still intact. So I think the amazing thing is that what you see here in terms of the kidney will still be functional after the surgery. So rather than having to remove the whole kidney, uh, we were able to perform what's called a partial nephrectomy and thrombectomy. And so this was actually published just last year. It was actually the first description of doing a robotic partial nephrectomy in a tumor uh, with, with a patient with, um, who had an inferior vena cava thrombus. So I think that highlights, again, in a very whirlwind tour, some of the uh, surgical advances that are available to patients with kidney cancer, whether it's small or large. I think regardless of uh, how we do the surgery, it's very important uh, that oncology or cancer control is the number one priority, whether it means you're doing a partial nephrectomy or a radical nephrectomy, whether it means we have to do an open uh, incision, which is larger, or smaller incisions. We know that with advances in technique, patients can go home sooner, they can get back to work faster, uh, you know, and pain is less and, and blood loss uh, with potentially fewer complications compared to open surgery. Uh, obviously, as I've mentioned throughout my talk, that a lot depends on the tumors, uh, also depends on the surgical team, 
uh, that's uh, you know, appropriate uh, to determine uh, what is best for the patient. And then lastly, and perhaps more importantly, at least most important for this talk, is that I think optimal treatment of kidney cancer um, for some patients is going to require multimodal therapy, uh, which is typically a combination of surgery or treatment, whether it's immunotherapy or some type afterwards, and in some cases even engaging medical oncologists beforehand, uh, and really stresses the importance of what we do uh, here at Sylvester in terms of research, uh, clinical trials, and really trying to engage all of you uh, in terms of engagement to try to learn collectively on how we can continue uh, to improve our care for the patients. So, with that, I'd like to end and, and hopefully keep on time, and perhaps we have time for uh, questions, um, and I'll turn it over back to Dr. Mershan uh, and the team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, great presentation, and many times when I see videos like this, I say, Thanks for the urologic surgeons. They do, they do an incredible job. And as uh, Dr. Gonzalo said, uh, this is a team effort, okay? Uh, surgery in cases where surgery is indicated <coughs> is, a, is a critical part of the treatment. And then there's some, always there's something else. I have a question for you, Dr. Gonzalo. Uh, like uh, you uh, mentioned cases where you did a total nephrectomy or a radical nephrectomy, which is removal of the whole kidney, and in some situations, a, a partial re a nephrectomy in terms of the removal of just part of the kidney. Many patients ask, uh, why uh, do I have to have a radical nephrectomy if my tumor, let's say, is a medium size, not so big, or a, and why cannot have a partial? or why did they have a partial and not a total? You explained that partial nephrectomies have benefits in terms of preserving the kidney function. But sometimes patients may ask, like, why did they have a radical nephrectomy compared to a, a partial? So what, what makes you decide <coughs> uh, whether to remove the whole kidney or part of the kidney? All right. That's a, that's a great question. We get that all the time. And really, there's no single answer, I think that's appropriate for that. It depends on a, a bunch of different factors um, taken collectively together for each patient. I think if you're to say for me what's the, probably the most important contributor to doing a partial or radical, it's probably kidney tumor size, how large the tumor, whether it falls into that stage one or stage two or even stage three category. I think once you're getting to the higher stage, it's probably more appropriate to do a radical nephrectomy than a partial nephrectomy. I think the other uh, component is the location of the tumor, uh, because even a small tumor in a more challenging location, as I've showed uh, on the, uh, the videos, uh, may be more appropriate for a, a radical uh, because of the risk of complications. We know that when you do a partial nephrectomy, uh, because of the complexity of that surgery, there can be a higher complication rate compared to total removal of the, uh, the tumor. Um, so I think those are probably the two uh, biggest drivers. I think. Also, you have to consider that <clears throat> normally in most situations, thankfully, patients will have two kidneys. And that as long as the uh, unaffected kidney uh, is viewed as normal, that it, you can actually most likely end up in having a radical nephrectomy and still be okay without kidney uh, risk of significant kidney disease long term as long as people take care of themselves, make sure their blood pressure is controlled, et cetera. So I think that uh, especially for the uh, larger tumors or what we call medium-sized tumors where it's, you know, you're going back and forth between doing a partial or a radical that as long as the, you have a normal, what we call contralateral kidney, that regardless of its partial or radical, you make the best decision uh, from a cancer standpoint for what's best, so. Thank you. Uh, and another question that many patients ask, uh, they ask the urologists and also they ask the medical oncologists and we usually refer them back to, to our friends, the surgeons, uh, when we see patients, for example, uh, after surgery, one month or three weeks after surgery, they always ask, uh, when can I start doing exercise? Yeah. Or when can I start helping <clears throat> at home or doing my activities? Right. So, uh, great question again. I think that points to one of the benefits of the surgical advances with minimally invasive approaches uh, is that to get back to work, driving, going to the gym, running marathons, um, can be much quicker 
uh, when you don't have a big incision to recover from. Uh, so typically if it's a larger incision, it could be up to four to six weeks, probably more closer to the six week side uh, than the four week side to recover. Uh, when we do a partial nephrectomy or a, 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 you know, where we don't have to make a big incision, I'll typically tell patients they can, uh, you know, they can probably drive with, within a week or so after surgery, one to two weeks, but getting back to full activities like a gym or heavy lifting or training, I usually wait three weeks, I, I, I would say, after surgery, because I think the biggest risk at that point really isn't so internal. It's, it's about, I tell them, I don't want them to get a hernia uh, because they're pushing so much on their incisions. So. I think in my practice with a minimally invasive approach, I say three weeks um, for full activities with, uh, including gym activities, three weeks after surgery. Great, and, and final question from my part. Um, how do you see, how do you envision the future of kidney cancer surgery? What do you think will be the, the new developments in the next five years or so that may improve of what we already have now? Yeah, so along, as I said, with technology, that will continue to improve, better visualization, um, you know, better instruments, but I think perhaps one of the biggest, uh, uh, I think, advances is going to be made, as we said uh, before, in combination with working someone like yourself or your colleagues. How do we begin to utilize, particularly for patients who have the more advanced disease, right? So if we can uh, get to those patients, and we've already seen it in some cases where we initiate uh, perhaps a systemic therapy to shrink a tumor down, now who knows, at some point, those tumors in, a, in an ideal situation, a patient may not need surgery because we may be at a point one day where you could take a pill or get an IV medication. We've seen it in many cases where it could actually get rid of the tumors completely. That would be a miracle at this point, and, and I think you know certainly is is a possibility. So I think the ultimate goal would have to be. I hate to say it, will put me out of business at least from the kidney standpoint. No surgery, but I think an advance would be how we integrate these things, particularly for people with advanced disease. Um, to downstage or reduce the tumors so we can make this, the surgery uh, as small as possible. Any questions from the audience? Okay. Yes, sorry, I, I forgot to mention. I missed uh, mentioning that I also had a radical nephrectomy, so my kidney, my, the tumor was um, going on through the vena, through the renal vein and up to the vena cava, and it was seven centimeters by 6.5 by six, so it was a large tumor and um, similar to the one that uh, Dr. Monsalvo showed, but it was a little bit more aggressive. So just wanted to share that. Yeah, there's hope, and I'm still alive. <laughs> Anybody else, any other questions? How many doctors are manning the robotic instrument? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that you'll need at least two. Um, one uh, who's doing the operating, a uh, surgeon like myself, and that's the person who's sitting at that console, that thing where you put your head in. And then you'll need another uh, uh, assistant, which who's usually another surgeon uh, at the bedside doing suction and exposure. But as I said, it extends beyond that. Those are the two people actually primarily involved with the surgery, but we have uh, scrub techs, we have nurses in the room, circulators, you know, people manning instruments. So it's really, again, as I said, uh, a team approach even in the operating room. One, one, yeah. yeah. Is that uh, robotic surgery available for the lungs? Yes, yes it is. We have excellent uh, thoracic surgeons uh, here at Sylvester um, who do lungs through Dao Nguyen uh, is one of them who I know and uh, work go well. Uh, with. Um, so yes, that's uh, the answer to that question. Again, it would be patient specific and a, to see whether or not it's appropriate, but they do do uh, robotic surgery um, for, for lung cases. Thank you. In, in that study that you presented with partial nephrectomies and radical nephrectomies and the overall trend of patients' kidney failure throughout time, yep. what would you say would help a patient from that declining EGFR if they did have a, a radical nephrectomy? You know, I think I, I briefly mentioned it earlier, uh, and again, that would be, number one, I think good blush, blood pressure control and, and uh, really optimizing everything else that goes into a patient's well-being, um, a healthy diet, exercise, you know, the things that we talk about, and I'm sure someone, I think, later in this conference are going to talk about. That's where I think each of those elements are going to be even more important uh, to help preserve uh, what 
kidney function a patient might have and also to, to uh, prevent uh, development of uh, subsequent kidney damage uh, into the future. But I think, yeah, blood pressure is probably at, towards the top of that list. Great, so I think we may have time for one more question. Anybody have yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. So, well, when you do the surgery to get like clear margins, would you say that Wolfrack helps you accomplish that effect? Well, I, again, it's, it comes down really to the surgeon. I think the robot, yes, definitely can help accomplish that, but that can be done laparoscopically or open. So I don't, really don't think there's any, um, you know, improvement in what we call margin status, regardless of technique, um, as long as it's done properly. Um, when they speak about it, stage four, um, if I understood what my oncologist said, it can mean that it just has metastasized to one other part. Once it's just metastasized, a little even, it's automatically stage four. That's, that's correct, yes. Right. I'm very happy to see that there's a lot of interest and a lot of very help. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there a space the wall cannot reach? Um, in terms of the kidney or not, I mean, is there, so the question is, is there a space it can't reach? I think it can reach, it, it can be more challenging to reach. Uh, I would say that, you know, yes, there probably is potentially an area that it couldn't reach. Uh, and if that's the case, then we'd have to do it by hand. But. I haven't personally experienced that. I think I've been able to reach every area that I want. I, my urologist told me, because I have an aggressive cancer though, in stage four, he told me, I think we're not going to have problem after the surgery because I didn't think only the problem, there is a left node where he is, we ah. can reach it. Yeah, okay, so that make, helps explain it a little better for me. So I think, yes, there are limitations, whether it's robotic or open approach. Again, I, it pains me to say it. There are limitations that a surgeon can help uh, sometimes be, because of the fact that this has spread beyond uh, what we can effectively treat from a surgical standpoint, right? So getting to your question about stage four, uh, once the tumors or tumor cells start getting beyond areas um, that we as surgeons can safely uh, remove, uh, that's where, again, someone like Dr. Mashan or his team, Dr. Sharma, uh, would be able to help uh, more effectively than, than a surgeon. So that's why it's important to have, uh, you know, that multimodal approach to it. So yes. I, I just have a technical question. Sure. Um, in the last clip, you, you were stitching, and then it looked like there were little clips. Oh, yeah. Or, um, so I know the stitch is usually just dissolved, but what right. happens to those clips? Yeah, some of those clips can actually dissolve as well. They're just very dense uh, material known as Vicryl. They'll dissolve over time. Some of them actually won't, um, and they're are kind of permanent, uh, you know, and are, we say, similar to uh, staples or, or anything. Um, but they're safe in the body. They stay there and help us to be, obviously, uh, control the blood. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalo, for an outstanding presentation. Thank you. And thank everybody for your questions. Thank you. Now it's time for... All right, again, first, thank you very much for, for being here. Uh, it has been an exciting and a very informational morning so far. I love the interaction, a lot of questions. Uh, I, I see a lot of good energy here, and that's basically all of us will, will gain from this. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the treatments of, for kidney cancer, expand a little bit more on what Dr. Sharma has uh, uh, talked in her incredible presentation, and, and this is just one slide, like a very snapshot of a very, very small summary of the basics of kidney cancer before we go into treatments. Okay, as Dr. Sharma said, kidney cancer uh, arises in the kidney tissue, in the, in the uh, uh, parenchyma, we call, of the kidney, okay? And also, we know that kidney cancer can metastasize or can spread to other organs. Finally, we need to recognize that kidney cancer comes in different flavors, okay? These five subtypes are the most common, but there are many, many other, okay? As Dr. Sharma said, about 30 different, less common subtypes. Some of them are less than 0.5%, less than 0.1%, okay? 
thanks to our experience, okay, we have seen, I would say, almost all of the rare variants of kidney cancer and are developing experience and expertise in also not only the common types of kidney cancer, but the rare forms of kidney cancer, especially through research. Now, uh, for the, uh, the members and the uh, patients or caregivers who speak Spanish, we would probably be doing next year some like bilingual thing. Right now, what I did is in the lower part, I'm basically putting a little bit of uh, the information that is in English upstairs uh, in Spanish, all right? So hopefully that would help. Now, let me introduce you to your kidney cancer team, all right? You can see a lot, a lot of different specialists and a lot of different staff members who basically will work day and night to try to take care of you, okay? And it is not only the doctors who, that have more visibility like the urologist, like Dr. Gonzalo, or the medical oncologist or the pathologist, okay? There's a serious, a, a huge, huge team, okay, of specialists from the radiologist who really read the scans and help us determine the extension of the cancer to uh, our incredible nurses who help us taking care of the patients or helping us in research, pharmacists, psychologists, uh, palliative, do palliative care doctors who help, let's say, treat pain, uh, nutritionists, social workers, physical therapists. Not all patients need all the different team members, but they are available, and they are available here at Sylvester. A very important part of the team that we always tell our patients is a primary care physician, the PCP, okay? We are very good at treating kidney cancer. We, we hope and we believe we're very good at treating kidney cancer, okay? And we work as a team with the PCP to help us and to help the patients take care of other medical issues that the patients may have, like diabetes or high blood pressure, other conditions, okay? So there's a huge team that is centered around our patients. And why is that? Why do we need a big team? Because kidney cancer is a very complex disease. Let me also give you a, a, a quick summary of uh, the important circuits or the important pathways that explain why kidney cancer metastasizes or why kidney cancer progresses, okay, Make, gets bigger, gets more, uh, uh, like it goes to different organs, et cetera. And uh, so these are very kind of like complicated, confusing slides, but I want you to first pay attention to this red line here, okay, which this is the, the, the blood supply. These are the blood vessels that feed the tumor. The tumor is this star with a circle here, okay? And uh, uh, one of the initial findings when we and other people were doing uh, research in kidney cancer is that kidney cancer in general, especially the more common type clear cell, depends a lot of, on blood vessels, okay? We call it tumor angiogenesis. And uh, this is because of some of the genetic mutations that Dr. Sharma was talking about, make it that the tumor cells are so smart that they develop chemicals or they produce chemicals around the tumor cells in the normal tissues to attract and to make blood vessels grow so the blood vessels can take the blood and feed the tumors, okay? Kidney cancer is very smart. And it, does, what, it is one of the cancers where this tumor angiogenesis is the predominant feature or a predominant feature in kidney cancer. So on one side, we have what we call the angiogenesis pathway, the one that basically helps develop blood vessels in the tumor. And the second pathway on the left is the immune pathway, okay? Because for years, it has been known that kidney cancer may be an immunologic disease or an immunogenic disease, not an autoimmune disease, but immunogenic disease, meaning that the, when the kidney cells become kidney cancer, they produce new proteins or antigens that our immune system recognizes as the enemy and tries to attack, right? So this figure on the left basically shows the different components of the immune system, okay? Different cells of the immune system that help the body fight and kill kidney cancer, right? 
Now, if we have such an incredible immune system that defends us from viruses, bacteria, parasites, and some diseases, why kidney cancer continues to grow? What happens with our, with our immune system? As I said, kidney cancer is very smart, okay? And the kidney tumors, in addition to making more blood vessels so they can autofeed and, and basically be self-sufficient to grow, the kidney cancer cells also produce other substances and other proteins in the cells, okay, that will basically uh, make the tumor cells invisible to the immune system. Even if we have a very efficient immune system, okay, the tumor cells in, in kidney cancer and in other cancers, because this also can be extrapolated to other cancers, basically make proteins and substances that basically put a break in the immune system. All right? And, uh, and this is how kidney cancer grows. Now, um, there are many other molecular pathways. There are other explanations why kidney cancer grows. But under the treatment point of view, these two are important. Okay? So, and just this one slide probably represents like 40 years or 50 years of research. Like each of the parts, each of the components, each of the cells required five, 10 years of research to try to understand the role in kidney cancer. And thanks to this research, thanks to this research, now scientists have developed treatments that block or that target each of the two components in these kidney cancer pathways. So I will show in the next slide a lot of the treatments and the evolution of kidney cancer. But like if we had to summarize the treatment types for kidney cancer, okay, we can summarize with the help of this slide. Treatments that basically help block tumor angiogenesis, to block blood vessel formation, and there are many drugs for that, and also drugs that will uh, enable the immune system to discover or to see the kidney cancer, to see who the enemy is again. All right, and those are the immunotherapies. And a lot of the research that has been going on kidney cancer has focused on these two pathways. And the uh, progress has been significant. This slide depicts kind of like a, a historical timeline. This is a historical tour of the development of the newer treatments for kidney cancer, okay? There were some questions as to what what is the role of the FDA in moving the treatment? So each of these treatments from 1992, okay, I think I was still in medical school or something like that, or going uh, a very long time ago, basically uh, we had just a one treatment approved for kidney cancer, which was those high dose interleukin-2, which was a form of immunotherapy, okay? Response rates, about 15%, maybe 4% complete responses. So if you were lucky, you had a great response, but it had a lot of toxicity, okay? Fast forward, okay, in the first decade of the 2000s, these drugs like sorafenib, sunitinib, bevacizumab, pasopanib, axitinib, all of these drugs, we call them targeted therapies, okay? And most of them are pills, some of them, like the bevacizumab, is a, an IV, but all these drugs target the first pathway that we discussed, which is the tumor angiogenesis. It blocks blood vessel formation in the tumors, okay? And after 2010, again, axitinib came, and other came, like cabozantinib, lenvatinib, tivosanib, all of those are targeted agents that what uh, they focus on blocking blood vessel formation because the kidney tumors depend on blood vessels, okay? After the first decade in uh, uh, the, uh, uh, 2000, after 2010, came the era of the immunotherapy agents. After the research showed that the immunity and the immune responses are blocked in kidney cancer. So one of the first drugs that came to, to the market that was FDA approved was nivolumab, okay? which basically is a, an IV 
that blocks a, a target called PD-1. It's a PD-1 inhibitor or a PD-1 antibody. Okay? That uh, started in phase one trials. Okay? I am the director of a phase one program. This is how the new treatments start, with a phase one study early on. It works, goes to phase two, goes to phase three. It works in phase three, then it's approved. Okay? So this basically revolutionized the treatment of kidney cancer. But it was a great progress, but it is not enough because not all the patients okay, are fortunate enough to have good responses to a treatment. And we don't know why some patients respond great or why some patients don't respond that great. And that is what here at UM, our laboratory, for example, and other laboratories here, are putting our efforts to try to understand why tumors do not respond to immunotherapies and what can we do to overcome resistance? What else can we add or what can we introduce in order to cure kidney cancer, overcome resistance, right? So in the 2015, nivolumab came, then 2018, a combination, a very potent and aggressive combination, and I have some patients who ha here who have had these combinations, ipilimumab and nivolumab, two immunotherapy combinations, which is very strong, and also was associated with higher response rates in patients who have never been treated. And it was approved for the first line treatment of kidney cancer, okay? Not for the second or third line, because it has been discovered that if we are using this in selected patients, we cannot use it in everybody. For me with metastatic disease, this can be a very good option, okay? Then, after 2018, came the, the, the big boom for combinations, okay? From studies in the laboratory in animal models of kidney cancer, we discovered that combining a targeted agent that blocks angiogenesis and an immunotherapy that enables the immune system to fight the cancer can, in some cases, in a good number of cases, can work better than each drug alone. And then, as you can see here, several combinations of immunotherapies and targeted therapies were approved, okay? And uh, so we are in 2021, as you can see, there were four different combinations approved for advanced kidney cancer, including pembrolizumab alone, which was, is not, was a, approved as a single legend, not for metastatic kidney cancer, but to try to prevent recurrence of kidney cancer, which was another big progress in how we treat. Before pembrolizumab was approved, we, we told the patients, you know, you have kidney cancer, you are at high risk for the cancer coming back, and there's no effective treatment that has demonstrated to decrease the risk. So pembrolizumab is one of the first drugs, and now here at UM, we're trying to build on that, trying to ask the next question, can we do better? Okay, and here we have clinical trials that will answer that question, can we do better than pembrolizumab after surgery, okay? So this is, again, a, a very big, big summary, and this is more or less the history of the drugs that were approved for kidney cancer. So, uh, Another important statement and concept here that we always tell the patients is that the treatment for kidney cancer is guided by the extent of the disease and by the patient characteristics, okay? We cannot extrapolate a treatment that we give to one patient into a different patient. Each patient is unique, okay? Each patient has a unique tumor which is different from other tumors different areas of metastasis, okay, different medical issues or medical problems, and that is what, what makes kidney cancer a complex disease and requires a multidisciplinary team, this big team that I showed you before, in order to find the best treatments for you. Okay, so if we talk about early stage kidney cancer, like stage one, stage two, or stage three, okay, most of these cases are treated with surgery, as Dr. Gonzalgo and Dr. Sharma explained, with a nephrectomy, a partial or 12 nephrectomy, okay? Then, 
when patients had a nephrectomy, they go to the medical oncologists, okay? And we discuss with the patients the tumor characteristics, we look at the pathology report, we recommend additional scans and labs to determine the extent of the disease. We talk to a patient, do lab to see if there's any other medical issues, and then we provide a recommendation. We assess the risk of the patient based on the pathology report and, and the patient's history, and then we either recommend treatment, let's say in this case with pembrolizumab, or surveillance when the kidney cancer is at earlier stages, like smaller tumors, low grade and low ag uh, aggressiveness, okay? So there has been a lot of effort trying to find treatments that would prevent recurrence, okay? So these are four big, big trials that happened in the early 2000s, early to like 2005 and above, that basically tried to ask a question, are these anti-angiogenic agents, the, the treatments that block blood vessels, are they able to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back? And the answer is no. None of these studies had shown a long-term benefits in terms of patients living much longer in terms of recurrence. Okay. And then when the immunotherapy era came, also we did a lot of these trials. We actually did all these three trials here at UM. We did all this research, collaboration with other centers at UM. Okay. And the, uh, of those, the trial on your right, the pembrolizumab trial uh, versus placebo, showed that pembrolizumab improves or decreases the risk of cancer recurrence. And that's why it was approved uh, in 2021, okay? But again, now we are happy with that, but we are not very happy because we want to ask, what, can we do better? And that's what we are doing research here at UM. Okay, for patients who have a metastatic disease or stage four, okay? And in some cases of stage three, when uh, like urologists, like Dr. Gonzalo may say, you know, the tumor is too extensive, too big, or the surgery is too risky, okay? Sometimes we also treat the patients as with advanced disease, with treatment before surgery or treatment instead of surgery. But in patients with advanced disease or metastatic renal cell carcinoma, there are several options, okay? The option that we use the most, again, depending on the situation, is systemic therapy, which are either the drugs that block angiogenesis, uh, immunotherapies, or a combination of both, okay? We also can choose active surveillance, for example, in patients who have, let's say, two millimeter, one two millimeter long nodule that is non-specific, we sometimes recommend to, to follow, or we do surgery or metastatectomy in patients if they have just one metastasis or metastasis that basically can be resected, okay? We will talk a little bit more about that later, okay? This slide shows uh, more or less the, the different options that we use in our patients with kidney cancer, okay? So, as Dr. As Dr. Sharma said, it is very important that we understand the patient's clinical characteristics we do a physical exam, we do labs like the one on the left, and that will help us determine what treatment may be better based on the risk. If patients is favorable, intermediate, or poor, we have either the immunotherapy or a targeted agents, combinations, etc. okay? And as you can see, clinical trials go first, okay? If we have a clinical trial available, we offer the clinical trial to the patient because this is what will help us develop and evolve further and, and be better, okay? We also have second line options, okay, uh, which basically have proven to help in patients who have not failed. And again, clinical trial goes first, okay? We also uh, have a good number of patients with non-clear cell kidney cancer, the less common subtypes. And again, if we have a clinical trial available, we offer that to the patients, and not everybody is a candidate for clinical trial, not everybody is, depending on the patient's characteristics, other medical issues, or patient preference. Patients may decide not to, and that is totally valid, right? And in patients who, who do not qualify for clinical trials, there are 
options that have been shown to help in non-clear cell, okay? And uh, I'm not gonna recite all these names, but these are the drugs that have been approved for kidney cancer in some of these situations. Okay, other alternatives, okay? Sometimes we see patients who have isolated metastasis, let's say one small lung nodule and nothing else, <coughs> or nodules where we can rem uh, uh, easily remove and that's it. Sometimes we uh, uh, offer this, we uh, consult with our friends or sur the surgeons, and if they think it is feasible, they do that. And now sometimes, right now, if we do uh, this removal of an isolated metastasis, if only one, we remove it, and then we may treat as patients who had a nephrectomy, probably with a, a immunotherapy to decrease the risk, okay? But again, every treatment is different, every case is different, we cannot really generalize or extrapolate. Watchful waiting, is that an option, okay? Meaning no treatment and no surgery? It is, okay, in very selected patients. There may be some patients who have significant medical issues like heart disease, uh, diabetes, hypertension, out of control, and each, either autoimmune disorders, that either option may not be viable, and the patients are doing fine, they, they, even that they have metastasis, they are stable, sometimes we may offer, you know, let's watch and wait. And when we see that the tumors are growing, then we, we uh, uh, recommend treatment. Okay, and one size does not fit all. There are multiple factors. And uh, as I said, the patient's health, the characteristics of the tumor, patient preference in terms of side effects. Uh, uh, Anna Harwood is gonna talk about side effects, uh, whether it's clear cell or non-clear cell, uh, and also the experience level of the physician, the oncologist. And uh, it is a, also another important statement, uh, uh, take home message, experience counts when we treat kidney cancer. This is just a, a quick summary of what is coming. Okay, this is a very, very busy slide. You are seeing all the different immune cells uh, and all of these are potential targets where new treatments are being developed. So it is like uh, ever expanding and uh, uh, that's what makes the future very promising in kidney cancer because there's more and more trial, uh, uh, trials of new drugs that are being tested in clinical trials. We have a good number of them, we don't have, we don't have all, and, uh, but, but that's what helps the, the field moving. Other drugs that are more, a little more advanced is, for example, new drugs that have a different mechanism of action that block an important circuit in the kidney tumor uh, called hypoxia-inducible factor with belzutifan. It's being developed, okay? It is approved already for patients with kidney cancer associated with a genetic syndrome called von Hippelindau or VHL, only for those cases. And it's being tested in other uh, 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 situations in clear cell kidney cancer. Here at UM, we are very strong in oncolytic viruses, okay? Both our laboratory works on oncolytic viruses and we do clinical trials in patients with kidney cancer and other cancers, and we have seen very promising results as well. These are not approved drugs yet, but they are promising agents. So in conclusion, we can say that the field uh, of renal cell carcinoma and the state, if we say the state of the union, kidney cancer is strong and is getting stronger, okay? And we are very happy for that. Uh, there has been a lot of progress in the treatment options, surgical options, diagnostic in kidney cancer with immunotherapies and targeted therapies that block angiogenesis, okay? And the future is bright because there's a lot of new targets, a lot of new treatment and strategies that we are testing and others are testing to try to even make things better for our patients. And uh, uh, the, the last slide is just to say that even though we have made a lot of progress, we need more, okay? We always need more. We as scientists, we, are, we get happy when we get a good outcome and then that happiness goes to the side and we said, what is next? Okay, that is the nature of research. What is next? And we and other centers in the country are asking that question in kidney cancer, what is next? Like newer treatments, trying to find individualized therapies, uh, molecular analysis, artificial intelligence, 
All of that is being done in part by us, in part by other centers. And that is what will bring more and more hope for the patients in years to come. Thank you very much. Any questions? Doctor, I have a question. Is there room for like an uncle type of genetic testing that helps you determine if the patient would be a best candidate for immunotherapy or chemotherapy? That's an excellent question. So uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of, a lot of effort in many cancers trying to find what we call biomarkers. That is a name of this uh, testing, biomarkers that will tell us, will this patient do better with immunotherapy or will this patient do better with uh, targeted therapy or other treatments? Okay? In many uh, uh, cancers like breast cancer, lung cancer, even bladder cancer, uh, colon cancer, there are. In kidney cancer, unfortunately, there are no biomarkers, and not even genetic biomarkers, okay? We know the gene mutations in kidney cancer, but we cannot target those gene mutations. And that is different from lung cancer, for example, that the lung cancer doctor says, you have a mutation in EGFR or in MED, there's a pill for that and patients get treatment. The, the difference in kidney cancer is that the mutations that occur in kidney cancer, most of the mutations in the genes are genes that not genes that uh, basically promote kidney cancer, but are mutations or uh, blocking in genes that prevent kidney cancer. We call tumor suppressors, okay? Tumor suppressor mutations are very important in kidney cancer like VHL, von Hippel-Lindau, BAP1, et cetera, all those tumors there, all those genes, are like the molecular policeman of the cell, because when there are cancer cells, they destroy. In kidney cancer, many of those tumor suppressors are out, are absent or silent. <coughs> Unfortunately, there are no drugs to make them active again. They, they don't exist, and it's very difficult. So that's why what we do is we try to understand the consequences of these gene mutations, like increased angiogenesis, like uh, immune suppression, to try to attack on the sides of kidney cancer. Any other question? Another very good question. Uh, again, I'll repeat it to the audience. Uh, when can ablation be done instead of laparoscopic partial nephrectomy or surgery? And I would uh, say that it can often be done. Um, and that is certainly another option. I did not mention it in my talk because it was mostly focused on surgery. But again, that's a, um, uh, an approach that is not quite cutting out the tumor, but being able to destroy the tumor cells either by freezing it, that's called cryoablation, or sometimes they'll use heat, uh, less so these days. I think most people will freeze it. Um, uh, the other form is called uh, RF, or radiofrequency ablation. Uh, and these forms of treatment really are, are best reserved for patients with the smaller types of tumors. So they're not appropriate for probably, I would say, stage two or higher. There are always exceptions, but you're not talking about ablating those tumors. But for those stage one tumors, um, which are frequently treated by partial nephrectomy, I think ablation is a very good option for patients. Now, not all tumors can be treated with ablation, or I would say are going to be better treated with surgery. And again, that's going to depend on the location of the tumor. Is that tumor deep within the kidney, as I showed in some examples? Is it, is it close to what we call the collecting system? Is it close to other important structures, such as the ureter or the vessels? And so trying to do ablation in those areas, like surgery, is a little bit more complex. And if those tumors are not located in favorable areas, ablation uh, may not be the best. But I think ablation uh, does represent another very good option uh, for patients in addition to surgery uh, if they want treatment um, and, and perhaps uh, surgery uh, may be too, too much for them because, again, some patients can have um, you know, uh, medical conditions uh, for which ablation is going to be better. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, the, the issue of funding for research that's been mentioned a couple times. As patients, what can we do to promote or facilitate funding from whether government entities or corporate, whatever? What, what can we do as patients to promote? Thank you for the question. This is a very, very important question. This is a, a, something that everybody in the field of kidney cancer is trying to, to promote, okay? Uh, one way of doing is by, uh, for example, uh, supporting kidney cancer organizations like the Judy Nicholson and there are other organizations that they go to the government, they go to Congress to say, you know, we need more funding for kidney cancer, give us more money, okay? That's one way. The other way is by uh, raising awareness about the importance of research first and kidney cancer research in particular, okay? Because like we as individuals cannot solve the problems in kidney cancer funding, for example. Like I can't, like a, a, but, but a lot of people getting together, okay? Contributing a little bit, for example, with the Dolphin Challenge Cancer, the DCC that happened two weeks ago, okay? We are raising funds that will help the research, okay? Uh, uh, talking to friends. Uh, uh, we at UM are planning, for kidney cancer in particular, to raise more awareness and to raise awareness of the importance of funding and, for example, how can patients help? You could help by basically giving your story. Say, you know, I was on a clinical trial or I benefited from research, I am enduring kidney cancer, I know how hard this is, and we need to do better. We need to do better, government needs to, to help, private institutions need to help, uh, uh, individuals who can help also could help as well. So basically as a patient, raising awareness, joining uh, foundations and kidney cancer organizations that will make them stronger, okay, with a stronger voice, and uh, talking to friends to, to basically say, you know, kidney cancer research is important. And if, uh, like, individuals can help sometimes, also that will be very, very uh, helpful. Uh, and, and there are mechanisms uh, in all the different institutions, mechanisms, where basically uh, there could be some, some support, uh, uh, donations, et cetera, right? But, but it is a multifactorial. Okay, a lot of our research comes from NIH. We are an NCI-designated cancer center, which means that we get support from the NIH to do research. And sometimes that is not enough because there's so much research in different cancers. And kidney cancer is a very, very small piece of the pie, a very small piece of the pie. The important question, thank you for asking. Thank you. So, uh, as we continue the, the morning uh, uh, of uh, educational talks, uh, I would, it is my honor to introduce a, a colleague of mine, a Dr. Mario Bilusic. Dr. Mario Bilusic is a professor of medicine at the Division of Oncology at UM. He is also a, a, a genitourinary medical oncologist and a researcher as well. Okay. Uh, with Mario, we do research together, okay? We see patients with kidney and other cancers, and Dr. Bilusic has his, his research projects, I have my research projects, and uh, uh, we, we interact a lot. Dr. Bilusic came from the National Cancer Institute, uh, where he did a lot of uh, research in uh, uh, prostate, bladder, and kidney cancer, and uh, we, had the, we were lucky to be able to bring him here to, to uh, bring his knowledge and his experience to help patients with GU malignancies. Dr. Bilusic is going to talk today about uh, clinical trials in kidney cancer. Uh, what are they and are they for me? Dr. Bilusic? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Merchan. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, participate and share a little bit about uh, clinical research. So this is not just about a kidney cancer, just in clinical research in general, general about the clinical trials. 
So uh, as a you know academic oncologist, academic clinician, we do a lots of clinical research, and the research is uh, you know clinical research is research involving the people. There's a basic research when people do research in the lab, trying to learn more about you know medication and treatment options, and then when we try to translate that into humans and using the same things, that's what we call the clinical research. So there are two types of clinical research. There's observational studies that we just go back in the charts and we're trying to learn, okay, we notice that everybody who had, let's say, example, had a blonde hair, has this type of cancer, maybe there's some link, that's called observational studies. Low quali lower quality of research. Uh, but what we really like, it's a prospective study when we are testing something and monitor patient prospectively, and that's called clinical trials. So clinical trials, we can test the devices, we can test medication, we can test the surgery, surgical procedures uh, to make sure they are safe and they are effective. So before we are allowed to test something in the clinic, in the patient, there are a lot of work being done before that. So they are called preclinical studies that the scientists in the laboratory, they're trying to uh, perform laboratory tests and studies to find if this is working, what is the mechanism of action, how this treatment works, and then also they do toxicology studies trying to make sure that it's not too toxic, trying to find the dose of a drug. So all these things are happening in the preclinical work, and once they have this um, information and all this collected information, they file the IND investigation of new drug application with the FDA. And the FDA is a regulatory agency in the United States, and there's a similar cousin agency in Europe called EMA, and each country has a regulatory agency, and they review all these things, all this research done by the scientists in the laboratory before they allow us to use this in the clinic. And if those studies show to be you know, safe, then they say, like, okay, you're okay to proceed, and then we write a research protocol in collaboration with basic scientists, and then the FDA give us green light that we can proceed with a clinical trial. And uh, so what are the clinical trials? What characteristics are there? They are uh, you know, medical or clinical studies. We need volunteers to participate. So it, let's say if you're using the, you know, the non-cancerous drug, we use healthy volunteers, like for COVID vaccine, there were people, healthy volunteers participating in the clinical trials. For chemotherapy drugs, for cancer drugs, we don't use healthy volunteers because it's unethical, because it's not cytotoxic, so we use patients. But you know, it could be healthy volunteers or have be a patient. They last a long time. From the moment we write them, they get approved, takes five to seven years. There are lots of regulation, lots of rules we have to uh, obey and follow. And then, uh, you know, at the end, we analyze the clinical trial, and then if shows efficacy and activity and safety, moves on to the next level. And once we have a finalized, you know, phase two, three studies or you know, bigger phase two study, then FDA can grant the approval of drugs, and then drug becomes available for our patients. Uh, so this is the stages of a clinical trial. So you usually have phase one, phase two, phase three, FDA approval, and there's a post marketing or once drug is approved. We still cost, continue collecting information, learning more about the drugs. So the phase one, we are usually testing the drugs, finding the dose, and we don't know which patients will benefit from this treatment. So if you as a patient offered phase one study, that could be first in human. You may be among the first patients in the world receiving this, uh, receiving this treatment, and we may not know what the, uh, the, the, the drug doses, so there's a dose escalation. We may not know all the toxicity, even though we are testing on animals, on monkeys or like non-human primates, we still may learn that there is a different toxicity with, uh, you know, with humans. So that's why we start on the lower dose. We increase the dose slowly. It's closely monitored. There are lots of blood work. There are lots of safety mechanisms, safety checkpoints uh, during this process. And then once we learn what the dose is and how this works, usually phase one, it's an all-comer patient with different malignancy because we don't know for which cancer the drug may be uh, you know, good uh, choice for. And then we, let's say that there's a phase one, so there are different cancers, and we notice the people with you know, kidney cancer or prostate cancer having the most benefit. Then we select for the phase two, we select this group of patients with particular disease, and then we are testing is this really working? So we know the dose, we know the disease, which we should test the dose, and then we test in a phase two, trying to see if there's a signal of efficacy uh, that this is working. So it's like we would like to see that 25% of patients have a beneficial uh, response to this treatment, 
And uh, you know, we're also learning more about side effects. So once phase two study is uh, done and show the results, then goes to phase three study, which is uh, usually multi-center, means it's tested in multiple cancer centers, multiple countries. So they are usually like you know, 100 plus countries, thousands of patients. Uh, so those are usually run by uh, you know, big pharma. They're trying to prove the efficacy. And once the phase three study is positive and they have results they would like to see, they submit the package, all the data to FDA, then FDA analyze it by themselves, the results as well as the European Medical Agency, and then they approve drug for a market. So what FDA, when the FDA approval is, they don't control what the price of the drug is going to be. They only control that the drug is safe, the safety and efficacy. And based on safety and efficacy, they will approve it. And then the business people will then decide what the cost will be, but FDA does not regulate what the cost will be. Once drug is approved and doctors are, um, start prescribing, they still start collecting the side effect uh, of the drugs. And sometimes, you know, drugs may be withdrawn from the market from the approval if they learn there's more toxicity. Because, you know, they made the approval based on 1,000, 2,000 patients. Once millions of people start, uh, you know, using drug, they may notice that there are different safety profile and some of those toxicity may be more, uh, uh, you know, more than anticipated and could lead to some modification on black box warning on the package insertion and things like that. So what are probability of success? Let's say you have a molecule in the laboratory and you're going to run phase one study, only 9% in oncology of drugs will make it. So there are lots of failure, lots of research done that at the end did not prove that this is working. And you know, many of us will ask why well, the drugs are so expensive because it's like running clinical research is very expensive. And if you only have 9% success rate, so there are lots of waste. Uh, but this is the only way uh, you know, how we can move the field forward. So there are lots of us trying to identify how we can make better studies, how we can make it cheaper, how we can uh, you know, do better, better job. Because I think you know, if you do, if you do business and you have only nine percent success rate, is not something you should be proud of. I think it's really we should try to understand this better. So there are lots of you know research done in silico using computers, trying to understand this modeling, so that we don't have to waste the resources, uh, you know, running the clinical trial. So why one should consider participating in a clinical trial? Uh, gives patient access to new treatment before they are widely available. So clinical trials started like five, seven years before drug is approved. So you know, cancer patient, unfortunately, if they have stage four cancer, many of them have no time to wait five to seven years for new drug. So if drug is available and you know, it's very promising, I think this is definitely a great opportunity uh, to have access to new drug. The patients actively participate in their care. Uh, it's also important for us as a researcher and physicians to learn about it and uh, help future generation of patients. <coughs> Every single drug we have approved today was a clinical research, was somebody volunteering 5, 10, 15 years ago. And thanks to those people who volunteer to participate in the research, we have drugs available today. So today clinical trial, today patients who participate will also help future generation of uh, of the patient. I tell everybody the same story. It's my, one of my favorite story. I was a fellow at the National Cancer Institute. And all, all things, what we're doing there was the clinical research. So everybody, every single patient there is on a clinical trial. And me, I remember myself as a first year oncology trainee. I took care of two patients. They had HIV and they had a prostate cancer. So I was taking care of for their prostate cancer. But they were diagnosed with HIV 30 years ago. And there was this miracle drug, or it was just a code name, which was a AZD drug, which is today most commonly prescribed HIV medication. And their first participant on the, drug, on the trial. So all their friends are gone. But they were lucky enough that they were on this trial and their HIV went to remission. They are still in remission. They're doing great from HIV perspective. But because of them and people like them who participated in the first trial that was run by Dr. Fauci, uh, all we have this most commonly prescribed medication worldwide, and they saved hundreds of millions of lives just because of their participation. So they help themselves, they help medical science, and they help the entire world, and millions of people worldwide. So I think if you think about you know, how you can help other people, like you know, just by participating in a clinical trial, you can make a major impact. And uh, as I said, like, you know, the treatment, what we have today, was a clinical trial before. So it's really, really important that we should always consider clinical trial. 
Um, so what happens in a trial? So, um, you know, we have extra people who part work in addition to physician and nurses in the clinic. We have clinical research coordinators, we have data managers, we have research nurses, and the crucial team, crucial part of the team, that they are available to make sure that everything is done according to protocol. Protocol is written, it's approved by the FDA, it's a holy bible, we have to follow blindly all these instructions in the protocol. They tell you exactly what you have to do, what blood work, which day, what time. Uh, so it's a lot of logistics and it's impossible to run clinical trial without help of the great people called clinical research team. Uh, so um, if you're accepted to a trial, once you agree, or you sign the consent form, tell yes, I want to participate, then the screening process starts. So then we do run the test, blood work, scans to make sure that this is good for you and it's safe for you, this protocol. And then, uh, then some trials are randomized. Then your computer decides which group you go to. There's always ethical aspect of the research. So some trials will include you know, sugar pill or placebo if there is no standard available. But if standard treatment is available, we don't do that anymore. You always compare this treatment versus standard treatment. So worst case scenario, you receive standard treatment, which you receive anyway if you don't participate in a trial. But you may have chance to have access to this new drug. You know, the randomized trials are important because there's the only way we can learn if treatment A is better than standard treatment. And uh, you, know, you will be prescribed standard visits uh, to clinic to check for safety. There are safety blood work, safety scans, and sometimes you may need to come more frequently if you have any troubles with the treatment. And you continue to see your physician uh, who is taking care of you, your oncologist. So uh, where you can find a clinical trial, you can always talk to your oncologist or your doctors, and it's always good. We always encourage you each time, you know, oncologist is offering you a treatment, you should ask if there's a clinical trial available. So by law, every single clinical trial in the United States has to be linked on clinicaltrials.gov. So this is a really important website that summarizes the database of all clinical trials in the country and in the world, because if, let's say, a company wants to sell drug in the United States and they run trial in Europe, they still have to register a trial here. Uh, it's a requirement. So you can go there, it's you know, a search engine, you can work with your oncologist or with your research team and trying to find, is there any trial available for you? There are some agencies that um, you, know, you can call, can help you navigate uh, through the clinical trial, because sometimes it's very complicated, you don't know which trial is good for me. And that there are support groups that also people can advocate and tell you oh, this was a good trial. And sometimes you will see advertisements coming, you know, either when you come to clinic or sometimes they may even be mailed to your home address after it's approved by the uh, IRB. So um, one of the very important aspects of the clinical trial is to include older patient and diverse participants. Because, you know, when we are testing the drug, we need to make sure the drug is working for uh, senior citizens, and that is working for you know African American, you know Hispanic population, everything. So you know the FDA doesn't work to see just Caucasian people and everybody in their 40s. I and mean, this is not the real uh, presentation. Of what people we treat in the clinic, our patients are elderly. There are lots of people who have other diseases. There are lots of people that different ethnic uh, groups. So we would like to see this representation from all the people we have here. We treat that they represent the patient clinical trial. We know that you know, there is some ethnic difference in genomics. Some people, you know, ethnic uh, groups may have different genomics, may have different reaction to drugs, so that's important to be tested. Also, elderly may have different comorbidities, they may have different toxicities from the treatment than younger patients, so we need to learn about it so we can report it, so we have real representation what this particular treatment does to different patient population. Uh, so um, what happens when clinical trial finish? So um, when the trial ended, the researcher will collect it, all the data, analyze the data. The clinical trials will complete uh, once you know, they enroll number of patients they plan to enroll, but sometimes trials can stop earlier. And there's a couple of scenarios when we have to stop trial earlier. Let's say there's some toxicity we didn't anticipate, and let's say there's some people having you know, some side effects, that can cause the study, uh, study closure. If they cannot recruit enough patients, that's the reason for study closure. If during this trial there are some ch safety checkpoints, and if the safety committee sees that trial is doing so, this new drug is doing great thing, they're not going to wait till the end of the trial because it's unethical. 
the other group like which receives standard of care is the new treatment is 10 times better it's unethical to uh, to continue trial and they will decide we're going to stop trial we'll offer this new medication to everybody on the trial and they'll submit results to the FDA hoping the FDA will approve this new drug and that happens uh, quite some time when they see so dramatic improvement that it's unethical to continue trial and um, the trial is then analyzed, presented at our scientific conferences, and then published in scientific literature, so it becomes available uh, to physicians all over the world. So one of the major problems of the clinical trial, this is what tells you why clinical trials don't complete. So it's a hundreds of million dollars cost, and still 40% of clinical trials never complete. And the main reason is, it tells you here, logistics, this and that, but poor accrual is the key. It's 38% of clinical trials do not get completed because people don't want to participate. And what is fascinating for me is when you're looking at clinical trials in pediatrics, 90% of pediatric cancer patients will participate in a clinical trial. We have excellent treatment options for kids for cancer. When it comes to you know, adults, it's not. It's always a problem. So it's 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 so fascinating. Then you have a you know as a parent, you will do everything for your kid, and you will sign up your child for a clinical trial. But when it comes to you, then you become more resistant. You know? And this is really you know strange for me. It's like you will give do this for your kid, and you don't want it for you. I mean, it's very strange. You know, but this is a problem. And I think we really by education we can make we can make a change. So the frequently people will ask, are clinical trials safe? So we, as a researcher, we are responsible for you as a patient. So it's, we are not responsible for a clinical trial. We are not paid by the pharma who sponsors the trial. Our main job is you. So it's your safety and it's your benefit. So your priority, clinical trial is second priority. So we will do everything what is important for you. And in addition to researcher who are all, we all trained and we need to take the best care of the patient, there are safety mechanisms in place. You have FDA who oversees all, all the trials and side effect. Each institution has IRB, it's Institutional Review Board, that it's committee that sits and review every single trial. We have to submit annual reports. Every single side effect goes to IRB. And IRB, there are people who are not investigators. There's ethics people, there are priests, there are patient participants. So all this committee of people, they review every single clinical trial and everything what we are doing. And they can give green light, they can stop the trial, they can give all the instructions to the researcher. And then there's a data safety monitoring committee. It's a committee as, as assembled by the sponsor uh, that have uh, investigators from different centers, and they also oversee the trial to make sure that it's safe. So have multiple backup mechanisms to make sure that what we are doing is ethical and it's safe. So um, one of the challenges, you know, that's what I was just uh, sharing with you before, only three to 5% of adult patient, cancer patient, enrolls in clinical trial. In pediatric is 80%, okay? 70% of the NCI trial, this is NCI data, NCI is a major funder of the clinical research, failed to complete a failed trial because they cannot accrue enough patients. 20% of trial, no single patient. That's a ton of work just to write the trial and 20% have no patient study. And 50% of trial of all trial funded by the NCI were never completed. Can you imagine if those trials were completed, I mean, we definitely have more treatment options available for the patient. And we can make the difference. So what are take home messages? Clinical trials are very important. They're very expensive. They're not expensive for the patient, but they're very expensive for the sponsor, for society. They're very safe. They're regulated and controlled. As I told you, FBA, uh, FBA, FDA, IRB, Data Safety Monitoring Board. They offer additional treatment options that otherwise are not available for patients because we cannot prescribe it. Insurance companies will not pay for it. Um, they are only way to develop new treatment for a given disease uh, and only way to move science and medicine forward. And this is the final message I always tell to fellows and trainees. You know, we have to take exam to be board certified oncologist or internal medicine. We have to be a recertification. And each time, it's multiple choice question. They give you patient scenario, they give you four or five answer options, and you have to pick one, what is the best answer. So if one of the answers is the clinical trial, it's always the correct answer. <laughs> so they want us always to be offering patients a clinical trial. And you as a patient and community, or patient, you know, caregiver, 
it's always important. So don't be afraid of clinical trials. We are here to help. We are here to move medicine. We are here to help you and as a patient, and then help medical science and help the future patients as well. So I hope I didn't, yeah, 20 minutes, okay, good. <laughs> we have, uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Bidufic. I think we have a, a time for a couple of questions. Any? Yeah, I actually have a question. Do you know if there's any extra efforts in uh, to gain uh, trust in communities that are often underrepresented in clinical trials? Yes. Are groups that have precedent to be wary? Yeah, so there are definitely efforts, you know, so there are some, you know, agencies, so there are efforts of people going to, like, the churches, giving education to schools or the minority people, but there is a definitely a historical and not so dis distant history that, like, you know, there were, like, some unethical research done in, like, early 70s, even in the United States, that led a lot of, um, you know, problems in the minority communities that they have, they don't have a trust in the, you know, com you know, you know, government and things like that, but because of the, all these things, bad things happen in the historical, there are so many new rules and regulation that now they are, you know, super safe uh, that way, but definitely education is extremely important. Yes, yeah, so like you said, like going to churches and stuff to kind of tell everybody, like, you know, that that was the past, but we're doing better, is that pretty much what's going on? Yes. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely right. But it's, it's effort. It's definite, definitely an effort. And also the NCI is, uh, they want us to come a plan with the minority. What, as a cancer center, we're supposed to make sure that we are offering the trials to uh, um, minorities and uh, ethnic ethnical groups, yeah. Yes? So if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov and you find a trial that might fit you, can you just call the doctor? Yes. Yes. So each clinical trial that go, when you go and search, they give you the contact information. There's email. There's like, you know, about the trial, tells you what inclusion, exclusion criteria are, and give you the who is the contact information. They give you email, and they give you coordinator phone number. Uh, or it also gives you code to the sponsor who sponsors the clinical trial. So sometimes you will find five trials, and you don't know which drug or whatever is better for you, or then you can just print those trials and talk to your oncologist and say, this is what I found. You can also... Uh, search based on the zip code, what is close to you, or you can search based on the country. Uh, so there are all these, like, you know, you have just to click, it's like a search engine generates the list, and then you click on each one of those, and you have contact information. You can just give the call. Uh, and that has to be updated frequently because government is, they have so strict rules about clinicaltrial.gov, so if you're an investigator, and you're required to report results there within a year, if you don't report you as investigators, it's ten thousand dollars penalty per one day delay. Yes, that's how rigorous they are. Uh, so they really want that it's updated. So if I'm an investigator, I really want to make sure that everything is updated there because otherwise I have to pay. Not the University of Miami. I have to pay ten thousand dollars a day. <laughs> Can you comment on the infrastructure in any institution, not necessarily used in Miami, responsible for? Uh, uh, lower recruitment of the patients or drop off of the patients who are already enrolled in the clinical trials, which is a major problem in uh, discussing some of the clinical trials. So, you know, we have each, each institution who does a clinical trial, they have a clinical, you know, trial research office. Uh, and then we are, you know, trying to, you know, talk to patients. Like you as a patient who participate in a clinical trial, you have a right to quit at any time. It's not, you know, so there are different reasons why people quit the trial. And some of them, they have toxicity. Some, for some patients, it's very time consuming. They want to keep their life going. They have to go to work. So there are multiple reasons why people are you know, deciding not to participate or to quit from clinical trial. But I think the main one is lack of information, lack of education. So I think we should do a better job educating people. So you, if you, as an investigator, educate your patient what is expected upfront, then the likelihood of being uh, compliant, the patient staying on the study is much higher and also have you know, people available to call if they have a question. You know, coordinator or research nurse, there's somebody you know, that you as a patient feel safe. If I have a question, uh, at, you know, I can email somebody or I can you know, call somebody and answer the question if I have a side effect. But it's really, I think, education is the key. And unfortunately, we're very busy, so that's why clinical research, you know, we have additional people, like a nurse practitioner, or nurses, and coordinators to be available for you and, uh, you know, answer your questions. One last question. Are all clinical trials available at all hospitals? No. 
no, no, no. They're very selective. So the clinical trials, basically, you know, for each the clinical trial to be open in a hospital has to be uh, the principal investigators. So, you know, Dr. Merchan and myself, we need to have a research interest in certain disease. So we then bring the trial here, and then we need to make sure that there is no competition. Let's say if you have a five trial targeting the same disease, it's impossible that you can grow into five trials. So we then need to decide based on our population, disease, what we see, what we think, what fits our research interest. Then we decide of those five trials, which one you're going to have here. So um, you may not have access to all five trials here, but they are, you know, at clinicaltrial.gov, or we may know what other trials available. So let's say if we, I, we don't have a trial here, but I know there is a trial somewhere else, I may refer a patient over here. There's a trial John Hopkins, you may want to consider going there. So I think definitely something, uh, it's impossible to have every single trial available. I mean, there are thousands of trials. We have here, you know, a few hundreds. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bilusic. Thank Great you. Great presentation. Thank you. Now, uh, before lunch, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to uh, Dr. Anna Harwood. Anna Harwood is a doctor in nursing practice. I think most of you know her. She's my... Yeah. Right arm? Yeah, she's my, she's my left hand because I'm left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I came here as a junior faculty in almost 15 years ago, but, you know, like I'm getting older. Uh, Anna joined uh, UM and she was my first nurse practitioner. And uh, uh, basically she has been with me, which is incredible because somebody to, to tolerate me and sometimes <laughs> things like that. So I think she, she's somebody very, very special. So Anna is going to talk to you about identifying and managing side effects from the kidney cancer treatments. Anna? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Michan. Thank you so much for being here today. It's such a pleasure to see you here on a Saturday morning. And it's, such, it's truly a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you, our patients, because we are here because of you. So my talk today is about identifying and managing side effects in kidney cancer patient treatment. And it's very important that you understand this because understanding your treatment, what it can cause, and what you have to do to manage the side effects in order to keep your quality of life is crucial. So I hope you are learning today and I hope I can fill in a little more information besides what we you see in our uh, daily clinic. So as was very well said by Dr. Mission this morning, this is a little landscape of how treatments were discovered. So we have the first treatment in metastatic kidney cancer approved in 2005, which was a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And after that, many other tyrosine kinases were uh, approved and it really enhanced the treatment for kidney cancer. After we have the first immunotherapy approved in 2015, which was a great treatment in, in kidney cancer. And after the nivolumab, which is recommended as a second line treatment, we have many other uh, immunotherapy approved. And more recently, we have a combination of, uh, of both as a first line treatment of uh, metastatic kidney cancer patients, depending on the patient. And more recently, we have a pembrolizumab, which is immunotherapy approved for patients considered high risk, the T3s that we saw very well presented by Dr. Sharma, that are uh, uh, offered to our patients during a year. I'm going to go a little bit of how tyrosine kinase inhibitors or target therapy work in metastatic kidney cancers. As Dr. Michon mentioned before, these treatments they target vessels that feeds into the stomachs, causing angiogenesis. Once that vessel is blocked, death is supposed to come after. What are these treatments? Sutent, pazopanib, lenvima finitor, cabozantinib, vandetanib. On the other hand, immunotherapy, the mechanism of action is completely different. What it does, it takes 
the breaks off of your <coughs> immune system, allowing your own antibodies, T cells, to see cancer cells and attack it. What are these agents? Ipilumumab, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, avelumab. So I'm going to, because of the time constraints, I'm going to give you a few side effects treatment in kidney cancer. And one of them is tyrosine kinase inhibitor or target therapy. As the name says, target therapy, it's targeting the vessels that feed into these tumors. One of the main side effects that we see is hand foot syndrome, which is a skin condition causing callus in the palms of your hands and sole of your feet, causing uh, not only callus, but sometimes blisters and sometimes pain. So in order to treat these side effects, we grade these this, this, um, this, uh, uh, side effects. Not only to help patients to, to, uh, to manage and what to recommend, but also to see when, what we have to do in terms of treatment. For example, grade one is it shows mild symptoms. So what do we treat these patients with? Exfoliate creams like urea in the palms of hands and the sole of feet. We can also use clobetazole, which is a very good anti-inflammatory to use a little further when there is pain. Sorry. So if there is a pain, these patients can also uh, have uh, something like, uh, thank you, Raquel, you were singer. <laughs> so if there is pain, these patients can also benefit from some Tylenol, right? When this side effect becomes a little more um, severe, regrade it is as grade two. And despite using all those uh, creams that we recommended when they were at the beginning, we keep them, we may in increase the frequency, but we also may need to hold the treatment if it gets intolerable, if it gets too painful. And sometimes we need to refer this patient to, the to a podiatrist or dermatologist to help us to better control this side effect before it becomes a grade three, which is more severe, which sometimes can take these patients to the hospital, right? So we wanna avoid that. Another very common side effect of tyrosine kinase inhibitors or target therapy is hypertension. So when the blood pressure is 140 over 90 is below, patients are asymptomatic, we may grade this grade one. Sometimes when we see these patients in clinic for the first time, we look at those patients to see if they are ready on blood pressure medications or if they are not, right? And uh, because we know with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors or target therapies, they will develop high blood pressure. It's just a matter of weeks. So this is grade one. Grade two, now the blood pressure is going higher. So we may need to introduce one antihypertensive we may do some lifestyle changes, low salt diet, more hydration, exercise, and we, may, and we tell patients, do a BP log. Continue doing a BP log because those numbers are very important to see how, how better we have to manage this side effect. So if the blood pressure besides adding an antihypertensive continues to be elevated, right, we may need to hold the treatment and allow this patient to go back to the baseline or grade one before it goes to grade three, which also becomes something more, more dangerous. Another very common side effect of tyrosine kinase inhibitors or target therapy is fatigue. And fatigue is not just one thing. It may be a cluster of side effects that we really don't know exactly what to say, so we check patients' labs, the thyroid, the adrenal, the electrolytes, make sure this patient is not dehydrated, make sure this patient is having enough nutrition. And if it doesn't, or if it does, it needs more teaching, we may refer this patient to 
a uh, dietitian or even to a physicist, which we have here to help these patients to uh, move a little more and, uh, and hopefully increase, build up this energy, which you know it's not easy, right? Now, if this symptom gets worse and now it's affecting your daily, your activities of daily living, and now you are slowed down, you're not moving much, you're spending too much time in bed. Or in, so we try to correct if there is any labs of abnormality. We try to uh, see what the problem is. And sometimes to better understand what is going on, we may need to put a hold on the treatment and do further investigation in order to send this to stop and, and hopefully not to admit this patient to the hospital. So far with me? <laughs> so what are the patterns of immune-related toxicity? So we know immunotherapy from our clinical experience is better tolerated than the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But we know that once those breaks are taking off the immune system, it can cause a buildup on T cells, you know, antibodies, and it can affect not only the bad, but it can affect the good organs, the good cells. So sometimes patients show with a, a skin rash, right? So this could be a side effect, so it's dermatitis. We do labs and we may see the liver enzymes a little elevated. This could be hepatitis for immunotherapy. We see the kidney function being abnormal. Now we have to be aware that this patient may have just one kidney, so we have to be very careful with that. So causing nephritis. Patients with joint pain causing arthritis or muscle pain causing myalgia. So all these things can be related to the treatment. How do we treat it? Because of the time constraint, I'm gonna give you just a few examples so you can, you can uh, uh, better understand because I know you have some understanding about this, mm -hmm. right? So one of the very common side effects of immunotherapy is skin rash or itching. With, I'm sorry, with or without itching. So, and we grade these skin rashes so we better understand how to treat it. So if it's that 10% of, uh, of your skin being affected by this rash, we treat with regular emollients, some uh, topical steroids, some antihistamine, right? However, if the problem is continues to grow and becomes more severe or extensive, and that's how we grade depending on the severity or extension, we may uh, besides the topical steroids, we may need to hold therapy and start these patients on anti, in anti, in an anti inflammatory like prednisone to treat the condition. And, uh, and sometimes it may take time for this to get to improve, to get better. So we start with the higher dose and we slow, we need down expecting or hoping that this improves. Now, if it doesn't improve, sometimes we do have to leave to uh, 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 prescribe uh, steroids a little longer. Sometimes we do have to refer these patients to a dermatologist to make sure that this is from the immunotherapy, right? And because if it's not getting better, what is causing it? So to see if this is really autoimmune related or if there is any infection or any other problem as a baseline. Another common side effect of immunotherapy is colitis or diarrhea. So if it's just less than four episodes of liquid stools a day, we may treat this with antidiarrheal medications like Imodium, uh, hydration, dietary, uh, changes like brat, brat diet, the bread, the rice, the applesauce, and the toast, and see how patients do. If the diarrhea continues, and now it's having, you are having more episodes of diarrhea, 
we may think about, okay, we need to investigate a little further here. We may need to treat, bring this patient for further labs, do some stool, stool uh, tests to see if there is anything else going on. And sometimes we do need to bring these patients to the clinic, see them, or, or have a telehealth or in-person visit to better understand what is going on. And uh, in order to hold the treatment and start on oral steroids. Because sometimes we do have patients who get extremely dehydrated from colitis, and uh, these uh, uh, may require hospitalization. And when that happens, we recommend a gastroenterology consult. Sometimes a colonoscopy is indicated to make sure this is related to the treatment and not something else. Another common side effect of immunotherapy are what we call endocrinopathies. The thyroid is a gland, but we have other glands in our body, the adrenal, the hypothesis. I mentioned the thyroid here because it's something very common when patients are on this kind of treatment. So we do lab works. Every time patients go to treatment, we do lab works to check their organ functions, including the thyroid. So if the TSH is below 10, and the patient is asymptomatic, we may just watch, right? However, if continue doing labs, these labs so show a higher TSH and now patients are more symptomatic, we may need to start them on the hormonal treatment with synthroid or levothyroxine. And if that symptom continues despite being treated with the synthroid, we may check for other abnormalities to see if the thyroid's not the only culprit, like the adrenal, or send this patient to see endocrinologist <coughs> to better treat and, and, and manage the side effect. So I just threw some case studies here which are very simple, and it may sound very familiar to you. Right? So this is a 54-year-old woman who presented to the emergency room with back pain. Like it was said before, there is no screening for kidney cancer. These tumors are usually found incidentally. Uh, patients become, have symptoms and they look it up and all of a sudden they see workup is done and there is a kidney mass. And that's exactly what happened here. The CT of the abdomen, see this. I, Let's see if I can see the right kidney mass and the left kidney is normal. But further workup with the CT of the chest pick up this lung mass as well. So now this patient not only has a kidney mass but a lung mass. So he was seen by, by uh, 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 interventional radiology, a biopsy of this mass was done and this was diagnosed as a clear <coughs> cell renal cell carcinoma. Now, what treatment to give, right? So based on that the criteria that was mentioned here before, looking at labs, looking at the time when this was found to start in treatment in patient's performance status, the treatment uh, falls into this risk factor and this patient was starting to ipilimumab nivolumab. So after three cycles of ipilimumab nivolumab, this patient starts with symptoms of coughing, shortness of breath, chest pain. So he went to the hospital because of the shortness of breath. Uh, workup with the CT of the chest was done. And, uh, and these opacities were seen in the lungs. This is the right and the left lung. These opacities were seen probably just to find the shortness of breath. So uh, a biopsy was done through a bronchoscopy. And uh, sure enough, this was a side effect of immunotherapy called pneumonitis. And uh, so the treatment was held, immunotherapy was held, and uh, this patient was started on prednisone, okay? Now, we cannot give prednisone concurrent with immunotherapy, so we have to start the prednisone, wean it down completely, and then check this patient if it was okay to restart the treatment, if it was the best option. So we repeat the CT scan of the chest, and this proved to be clean. So yes, we restarted the treatment 
uh, with nivolumab only, the last cycle of combination was skipped and uh, nivolumab was restarted. And this patient did have recurrence of the pneumonitis. This is another case study, a 67-year-old patient with back pain went to the hospital and the CT scan pick up this, again, right kidney mass compared to the left, look how big it is. However, further workup also show lesions in the spine and these lesions were causing pressure in the spine. So he was seen by surgeons and it was decided to resect that tumor. The tumor was resected and it proved to be renal cell carcinoma. So based on that criteria that we mentioned here earlier, it was decided to start this patient with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, cabozantinib. So after a few weeks, obviously we know that uh, uh, no, side effects were started with nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, and hypertension. So we have to bring this patient in, understand those side effects, do some more lab work to see how we, uh, what we exactly we had to do, and uh, add a hypertension uh, medic antihypertension medication. And um, sure enough, one pill was not enough. He needed more, and we had to hold treatment. Actually. We had to hold treatment and treatment once the, the side effects were manageable and back to grade one, we start back to treatment in a lower dose. So just to uh, summarize here, we know side effect management of these treatments are not easy. They are complex, they are very time consuming. Sometimes it requires a lot of lifestyle changes, not only for, from, from patients themselves, but from the family. We at our institution, we try to keep these triage nurse to be the connection between patients and ourselves to better triage these patients on the phone and, uh, and hopefully to uh, uh, decide what we have to do. Do we have to bring this patient in just for labs or do we have to see this patient in clinic or through a telehealth or something like that to better understand uh, what is going on? Obviously, you know, these are life changes that patients can, can do. If it's smoking, no smoke. If alcohol, no alcohol. Better uh, lifestyle changes with uh, diet, uh, uh, increase physical activity in your, in your, in your life, and uh, healthy cooking practice, which we all try to do. And sometimes, if this is not enough, if we see that this patient is doing well on the treatment, but this toxicities continue despite lowering the dose, we may think about treatment breaks. And we do treatment breaks by change a little bit how we do, how we schedule these treatments on a daily basis. Sometimes giving a weekend off may be good enough for them to feel better and then restart the treatment. Or sometimes two weeks on, one week off may help uh, to, keep, to keep patients on treatment and at the same time have some quality of life by better managing the side effects by having a sooner break. And this is pretty much it. Thank you, Anna. Great presentation. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, I have a question about the fatigue one, the symptom of fatigue. How often have you guys found it to be uh, like an underlying etiology like thyroiditis or colitis versus just fatigue alone? How often? Actually, very frequently. So when we see a patient, losing weight, right? And uh, with all this complaint, like I said, fatigue is just not one single side effect. It may be a cluster of side effects. So we may look at the labs, we may look at the dietary, if this patient is losing or not weight, right? And uh, if this patient is depressed or not. So all these are taken in account when see patients in clinic to better understand how to treat this, this uh, fatigue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about immunotherapy. So if you have uh, a patient that is already, uh, that already has immuno... Uh, 
autoimmune related side effects? Maybe, yes. Maybe they have uh, multiple autoimmune um, diseases. So what would you do with that patient with that? Right. Great question. So when before, you know, choosing the treatment for these patients, we have to see if they have underlying diseases like autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, for example. And sometimes this is very tricky because we want to treat, we need to treat, but we are uh, facing all these problems at baseline. So these patients are very, we have to look into very carefully to see if, our, if immunotherapy is the treatment of choice. Now, when the, the condition develops, and it depends how, how it happens, right? If this patient is functional, if uh, the disease is at, you know, there is disease, but according to the, the, the imaging, the disease is well controlled, we can continue with the just observation and, uh, and just watch this patient um, until something else develops. Yeah. At what point would you consider a dose reduction for a patient who's experiencing a lot of symptoms, but they're having a positive response to the medication at a higher dose? Right, right. You don't want to affect the, 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 the efficacy of the treatment. However, we are very um, mindful that if you don't do something about this side effect, right, uh, something else can, can happen. For example, if a patient has hand foot syndrome, and uh, he or she has tried everything that we had recommended to treat that, uh, the callus, the blisters, and uh, it's not getting any better. So we are, you know, safety first, right? So you have to stop treatment and uh, to, so the condition can improve, and then we, uh, you know, we will start when, the, when this condition is completely at grade one or patient's baseline before we restart treatment. It's a risk that is taking, but safety first. I may add something uh, to, to, to mm -hmm. the, the two questions about rechallenging patients with immunotherapy after they had an autoimmune disorder and dose reduction of either immunotherapy or target therapy. So in terms of immunotherapy, we do not dose reduce immunotherapy. We either give the immunotherapy or we hold the immunotherapy. And the reason for that is because the, the, re, the, the mechanism or why immunotherapies cause side effects does not depend on the dose of the immunotherapy, but depends on the body's, on our own immune system's response to the immunotherapy. And if the patient develops autoimmune side effects, they may, ca they may continue having autoimmune side effects if we reduce the dose in half or in a quarter or one tenth. Mm -hmm. Because it is not the effect directly of the immunotherapy, but the effect of our immune system that got activated. In terms of uh, targeted therapies, okay, fatigue is indeed the most common side effect, and it can be very debilitating, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, to answer the question as to uh, when do we draw the line, right, as to benefits versus side effects, okay? There is no, there is no uh, specific guidance or rules here that we just call to the book and follow. Every patient is different. Every patient is different, okay? We always try to optimize treatment uh, of the side effects, okay? before we decide to go down on the dose, especially if we're seeing a patient who is responding well. The other important consideration is, are there other options for the patient? Mm -hmm. So if the patient is having good response to a treatment, okay, and the patient is having a lot of side effects, sometimes we stop the drug and say, okay, let's go to plan B, or plan C, or plan D, right? Which may be less toxic. However, in some of the situations, in some cases, there may not be plan C or B or E because we have already used them. So it is a discussion between the patient and the doctor to basically uh, put Design. both the side effects and the benefits on a scale and say, okay, what is our priority? What are our wishes? And we always, we always ask the patient uh, for their wishes because the, the patients you 
you guys are the, our, our boss, right? Mm -hmm. We give you guidance. All right, right. so um, thank you very much, Anna. Great presentation. Thank you, thank you. One of the questions that 100% or maybe 95% of the patients ask when we talk about kidney cancer and kidney cancer treatment is about diet and nutrition. What can we eat? What can we not eat? Is there something that we can do to improve a, our tolerance to treatment or to decrease the side effects? Or even sometimes some patients ask, is there any, any specific food or something that may help me fight this disease? Okay? And uh, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Tina Cloney. You are from Millican I am Millican University. Millican University in, uh, Illinois. In, in Illinois, and uh, she's an expert in nutrition, and she has been a contributor to, the, to these talks, uh, and she gives a great presentation. So hope you enjoy. Dr. Cloney. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you? Good, good. Well, I hope you've learned. How many of you have learned a lot today so, thus far? Awesome. Well, I hope I can contribute to what you learn and give you some easy things to take away with you. I know you're not going to be able to do all of them, but that's okay. We're not perfect and we're not striving for perfect. So, let's go. Oh, first, um, yes, I, I, I have a doctorate and I teach in health and nutrition. I'm a health and nutrition professor, but also I'm a registered dietitian. I worked in clinical for 20 years and I love every opportunity to connect with the, the public again and help people um, live better lives. So I'm really, really excited to be here. So thank you so much for, for having me. I have no disclosures to report. I'm in this just for you. Okay, so when you look at nutrition, I've been in the field for over 30 years, and when I first entered the field, it was about preventing disease, nutrition to, or no, not disease, prevent deficiencies. So vitamin C and scurvy, folate, and um, spina bifida, but it has evolved. In the 21st century, oh my goodness, food is medicine. It's incredible, it's very powerful, very amazing. So I hope you fall in love like I have with what I'm gonna share with you today. All right, so looking at the science, we're talking about hope and beyond and what you can do. Reducing your risk, all right? Treatment and recovery, nutrition to fuel treatment. Nutrition does not act alone, but it certainly works with the, the physicians who give you your care, your nutrition care team, your um, cancer care team. So our goal today is to help you live better while you're combating your kidney cancer, as well as helping you um, in recovery, have a better recovery, and then reducing the risk of occurrence or met. So the things I go through today, I think you're gonna see, will help you do that. All right, so what are nutraceuticals? Can anyone tell me? What are nutraceuticals? Okay, wow, I'm excited. Do you know? Nutrition. Okay, it, it does relate to nutrition. You are right. So nutrition, nutraceuticals are a combination of antioxidants and phytochemicals. So when we eat food, we get so many benefits that we're aware of, but a lot that we're not aware of. So we're looking at antioxidants, vitamin C, beta carotene, vitamin E, and then selenium. And then when you go to the phytochemicals, how many of you knew the color actually provides benefit? That hue, the phytochemicals. So we have the blue, the green, the red, the white or brown, and the orange. So I'm gonna go through these. All right. First, what can they help us do with medical care? Reduce risk of um, damage to our DNA, all right? Um, damage to DNA can trigger abnormal cell division, all right? And it can affect methylization and demethylization of groups on our DNA. So what we choose to do, let's try to 
do as much as we can. We don't have control over everything, but nutrition is something that we can strive for. All right, so when you look at tolomer sh uh, shortening or, let me see if I can, oh, that's not what I was trying to do. If you look at tolomer shortening, look over here. This is a shoelace. And at the ends of the shoelace, you will see, it looks like the tape you find on a shoelace, but this is DNA. So those tolumers protect our DNA from fraying, just like the tape on a shoelace would prevent the shoelace from fraying. So our choices, it's interesting, because when you look at research, we see less tolumer shortening, greater lengths of tolumers with, with nutrition, with physical activity. All right, so wherever you are in your cancer journey, please know that you can make a difference. All right, you most definitely can make a difference. All right, so what do these nutraceuticals do? They reduce inflammation and oxidative stress, neutralizing free radicals. So all the physiological stressors that we come across in a day, all right, have these fruits and vegetables and beans, the things that I'm gonna go through, because it, it can make a difference in how you feel. Emotionally, you know what you're doing, what you can do, and um, fighting cancer. Okay, so also can prevent damaged cells from reproducing. How many of you are interested in that? Definitely. Slow the growth of cancer cells and deactivate secretions from tumor cells. Promote cell death and tumors and offset some of our unhealthy lifestyle choices. This is what's cool. So if you end up eating something as I go through the activity with you, but you balance it out with fruits and vegetables, that can help neutralize uh, those negative benefits or not negative consequences of not so healthy food. Only thing I know as a dietitian, though, if you fry fish, it does negate the benefits of the antioxidants of selenium. But when I go through these other things, you know, we're all human. We want different things, right? It's important just not every day, okay? And then balance it out. All right, so I'm going to do an activity with you, and I want you to remember as I do this, prevention is not the goal. Or not prevention. Perfection is not the goal. Okay. Well, how many of you have kidney cancer? Okay, so you know what? You have it. Okay, well, we're going to try to reverse some things and help you live a longer, healthy life. Like I showed you with DNA, prevent reoccurrence or prevent progression, reduce the risk. Okay, so that maybe that wasn't a slip, but anyway, perfect. I don't expect perfect on this. I'm not perfect with it. And okay. As we go through these 10 behaviors, remember small steps reap big rewards. All right, making small changes makes a difference. It's not all and none, okay? All right, think about, as we go through these, what you could change. What do you already do? Okay, I'm sure you do do some of them. All right, how many of you are in the mood for a stretch? Sitting a lot earlier? Thank you for raising your hand. Okay, <laughs> thank you, because here's the point. Um, with this activity, I'm going to ask you to stand up, all right? If you can't stand up, you're welcome to raise your arm, okay? All right. I appreciate that you are joining us in this. All right. How beautiful is this picture? <laughs> Nutraceuticals, phytochemicals, disease fighters. How many... You sure can. <laughs> Stay standing if you eat five fruits and vegetables or more a day. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. You have to stay standing. Okay. Well, unless you don't. So, okay. So, look at this. Paint your plate. I actually created this. Think about your plate and how colorful it is. Because when you look at these different... These are the phytochemicals, the hues you see in food. Not only do they reduce risk of heart disease, the blue, the purple, promote memory, reduce blood pressure, but also fight cancer. 
the yellow orange, the flavonoids, the carotenoids fight cancer, okay, in addition to heart disease. And you know what, and it, it pains me, I thought of this, unfortunately your fight isn't just cancer because as you go through this journey, you're also at risk of heart disease, right? Or the negative benefits of high blood pressure, okay? So, as you can see, and what I love about nutrition, it's a handful of things that you can do that make such a big difference in the fight and, and recovery. All right, so when you look at the, the white, brown, lowering risk of heart disease and also cancer, greens, I'm gonna go over what the names of these are in a minute, help prevent cancer, red, I'm sure you've heard of prostate cancer, right? So, are you getting five a day? And you wanna vary it up because you have different levels of nutrients in different fruits and vegetables. But this is an easy check. So, blue and purple, anthocyanins you will find in, or resveratrol you will find in it. Yellow, orange, carotenoids, and beta carotene. Okay, beta carotene is also an antioxidant in, in addition to being a phytochemical. Elagic acid, lycopene, Terastilbene, oh my gosh, who invented these words? It doesn't matter if you know how to spell them or say them, just go toward the color, okay? Green is a sulforaphane, zeaxanthin, lutein, and glucosinate, okay? And then white elicins, which you can get from your onions and garlic, and garlic is really rich in it and one of the most rich in the elicin. So I hope your garlic fans unlike myself, okay? <laughs> like I said, you don't have to do it all, okay? All right, so stay standing if you get 150 minutes of physical activity a week. How do we break that down? 30 minutes, five days a week, Ooh, okay? Or it could be 10 minutes, three times a day, five days a week. And you guys, it does not have to be working out, going to a gym, any of that kind of stuff. You can find things that you enjoy that's gonna help you commit to this goal. Dance, how many of you like to dance? Okay, how many of you live with someone? Turn the music on and dance. My husband and I do it all the time and it's so great for your marriage, so great for your health, so great for relationships. All right, so. Stay standing if you get the physical activity. All right, before you sit down, no, 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 stay up, okay? If your body mass index is less than 25, another predictor though of risk and affecting your, the cancer risk and recovery, look at these measurements. Less than 32 inches for the females, less than 37 inches for the males, but, if you don't hit this target right now, you notice I have or if. If you're working toward it, all right, if you're currently trying to be more physically active, that counts, okay? You're, you're doing well. <laughs> okay, and when you look at the picture up here, do you see the subcutaneous fat, the yellow? And then deeper in the yellow, that's visceral fat, and it's just not good for disease management, recovery, um, so, you know what, just 10 pounds can make a big difference, all right? So you don't have to get your BMI less than 25, just a 10 pound weight loss. All right, stay standing if you include beans and nuts in your meal planning. I eat a lot of nuts, they are so insanely good for you, and beans are so good. Soybeans, rich in ivoflavones, and then here you can see the beans and the flavonoids and polyphenols very important in that overall. So you have a lot of choices, okay? These are phytochemicals. All right. I hope I don't get it too many people that sit down on this one. Everyone, alcohol is on the carcinogen list, all right? Ideally, American Cancer Society does not recommend that we drink it, all right? It's a, it's a carcinogen, but if you do, Females should limit to one cup a day, okay, or one serving a day. Cup would be nice, wouldn't it? No, um, like five ounces of wine, a 12 ounce um, beer, um, a little shot, one half ounce shot of hard liquor, and then males twice that, all right? So if you're gonna do it, sip and savor, 
so it goes further. But ideally, um, not the best. All right, protein. Make sure you're going with lean protein. I'm sure you've heard less saturated fat, less trans fat, less cholesterol to promote your heart health. Well, did you know the pesticides that these big critters eat, they um, store in the fat of animals, all right? So if you're getting higher fat meats, you're gonna get more pesticides, all right? And pesticides do not do a body good, okay? Other things, the marbling, so when you are choosing, if you're going to, and we want to do less is best with the, the meat, okay, the red meat, um, make sure there's not a lot of the white marbling there that you get from like prime ribs and ribeyes. You know, if you're going to do beef, sirloin, filet. All right, continuing with meat, charring your, your foods on the grill or getting that crisp black Never let the flames touch your food on the grill. All right, very, very important. And I, just like so many people, love marshmallows that have the black around them. It's, it's charring, it's a carcinogen. So lightly roast them instead. And that's not too difficult to change because I've done it. Frying, grilling, and broiling. You, you have to be care careful, okay, because of the flames, those high temperatures. All right, I love this one. Why? Because it used to be you couldn't find any sliced turkey or ham or roast beef. All right, what I love about it now, the nitrites, you can now find uncured meat products if you look for them. It's kind of crazy when they make these meats that are cured, they rub them with um, nitrites and salt. You might see celery salt on there. We, not good, it's, the process is carcinogenic, just like smoked meats, the smoking, carcinogenic, okay? So please look for labels that say uncured, okay? Uncured, I promise you they are out there. All right, we're on number nine of 10. I don't know if you've been keeping count. I added sugar. How many of you knew that you should, oh, there we go. Oh. Okay, so here's the deal. It's the, it's the fructose in the added sugar. It, it's not glucose. Table sugar is fructose and glucose. It's the fructose in there, not fruit sugar. Fruit sugar is healthy. And then plus fruit, you get a lot of the, the phytochemicals and nutri nutraceuticals and antioxidants with it. So, ladies, six teaspoons, no more than, okay? Gentlemen, no more than nine. And then kids, little turkeys get more than, than females, all right? Sugar fuels growth, cancer growth, tumor growth, okay? And it's at fructose. All right, last but not least, try staying away from plastics that can increase your, your risk. You know, if you look at these three, six, and seven are the ones that you should be steering clear of. Uh, okay, this one, high density, or no, I'm sorry, polyvinyl chloride. All right, be careful what your milk containers are coming in. All right, or pour them in something else when you get home. Six, polystyrene. If you go out to eat and you get food in a takeout container and it's styrofoam, immediately transfer it when you get home. Don't buy styrofoam plates, don't buy styrofoam cups, okay? Steer away from six. And then seven is the bisphenol A. No matter how many times you go through something, you misspell something, okay? That's BPA, and you'll notice like baby bottles, no BPA. All right, threw away all my old Tupperware because of BBA, PBA, you know. Might be nostalgic, but it's not healthy. Okay. All right, to close, my timer never got set. All right, you are in the driver's seat. Okay, you can do this. Just drive slow. Don't take too many cha um, changes at once because um, you can get exhausted and overwhelmed and burn out. So of these, think about which things you can incorporate into your lifestyle. It takes 21 days to build a habit, 
All right, 21 days, so hang in there. So support is vital. Look at all of you. You're here for sem the, sem the same reason. Connect with each other, get each other's numbers. You can FaceTime, help each other, set goals together. All right, also your cancer support team. And then the Judy Nicholson cancer, um, Kidney Cancer Foundation. Get onto their website, wonderful website. A lot of resources, recipes, and some of the things maybe you were hoping I was going to say, all right, um, you will find on there, okay? All right, any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, regarding that polycarbonate slide, is, is it, was it like one through seven? You said to avoid all of them? No, or just the did one you see one the there? numbers? Yeah. Three, really three, six, and seven. Three, six, three, seven, six and avoid. seven, avoid. The other ones are okay. Yeah. So is there a, a, a sugar additive that you feel is okay or safe or maybe uh, categorized as vegetables? <laughs> I so want to say yes on that. This is on Can you hear me? I my diet coke. <laughs> okay. Like I said, none of us are perfect, and I enjoy my Diet Coke, too. All right, when you look at the, the research, aspartame has not been shown in studies to cause cancer. Saccharin did years ago in the 70s and withdrawn from the market, but it was rats, and it doesn't apply to humans. I think I steer away from it because you, the amount that you can have, the generally recognized as safe or the REI is so much smaller. And so that's kind of like a red flag for me. So aspartame has been, has been shown to be safe with, with cancer. And then Supalus, Splenda. You know, uh, Splenda's wonderful. You can bake with Splenda, all right? So the yellow packet. But um, what do I try to do? I'll do water, cut up lemon in it, cut up orange slices in it, trying to flavor it. Oh my gosh, the nutraceuticals. <laughs> and then just, you know, maybe limit the, the diet soda one, one a day or three or four a week. Um, maybe have some antioxidants with it to offset. Right. Yeah. Talk a little bit about sugars. So we read different things. Uh, shouldn't have any sugar to begin with because this is a food for okay. owners. Mm -hmm. And then they tell you some things that I read. Honey, then no honey. Stevia, no stevia, there's something else. I've got the name of it. There was something that just came out about stevia that was negative, and I can't remember what Erythrol. it was. Erythrol. Hmm? Erythrol. Okay. The sugar alcohol that came out in the news a few days ago. Okay. Yeah, um, and it's generally recognized as safe. There's not enough research to give you like an RDI for it. Um, so sugar, just doing the research that I did before I came today, it looks like they're talking about the fructose that's in sucrose, fructose and glucose. So you saw on my picture, high fructose corn syrup, your sodas, your candies, and then that candy, a lot of sugar, but also food dyes. You know, the Center for Public interest has gotten a lot of food dyes banned, and they're working on even more. So looking at your labels, trying to get foods that are colored with natural food versus chemicals. It's insane what they do in other countries versus our country. It's cheaper, and if we buy it, they're going to continue to sell it because it's cheaper for them to produce it with chemicals versus raspberries or prune puree. So. Yeah, less is best, so no more than, and you'll notice some of the things you say have this amount, at least five fruits and vegetables, the sugar, no more than 36 grams, no more than 24 grams, okay? Yeah. I had two questions, one with regards to the, the high grilling and stuff, so how about air fry, I bought an air fryer, or does that not make any difference? And my second question was about the slide on the BPA. I did buy glass, but it was just breaking, so like I, I, I got the BPA, um, but you know, they don't seem all that great, you know, the level of the plastic, the quality of the plastic, but it says BPA free, so. Well, it should be, Federal Trade Commission requires um, proper labeling, honest labeling, so I wouldn't worry about that much as, as long as you find one that's BPA free. Um, 
So the plastic's okay if it, as long as it says BPA free. That, well, and then the numbers. Watch those numbers. You know, remember the three, six, and seven. Those are the ones you should not have. Right. Three, six, and seven. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, your other question. You know what? That's been saving me. It just saves a lot of this, just not every day. Not every day. Balance out the meal with antioxidants because that's what they're saying to do. We're human. So right? it's not healthier to use an airplane. No, it, it would be for fat and looking at heart disease, but no. Those high temperatures are so much as you know. Not what you want here. <laughs> and we have air fryer, but we don't get that often, but we do do it. Um, best way to cook your meat, lower temperatures, a little bit longer, it stays nice and tender, but you can um, bake. Uh, I, you know, if you do the grill, don't have the flame so high. It's going to take a little longer to cook it, but the flames aren't hitting it, and you're not going to char it. Okay? So, steaming, What is your perspective on the housing components in the grocery stores being between organics and inorganic meats? And the chicken that is being injected with hormones, like, what is your opinion? Okay. What's the she, question? She's asking about organics. Yeah. Um, here's the thing to remember about organics. It has to be 100% organic to truly be organic. 95% or 70% labeling. It can have items in there that there's, there's pesticides. The further your food comes, the more pesticides get applied to it to reduce the pest or to reduce um, insects. Okay, so go to farmers markets for your fruits and vegetables. Um, try not to rely so much on the store for them. I know we're all busy, but. If there are a couple like vegetables you really enjoy, maybe you can do a container garden outside. Tomatoes and peppers, look at that lycopene and um, green sulfurophane. And I know it's work, but at least you know what you're putting your body in. Like I said, if we have farmers and they have farmer stands they put up, get online and see where maybe farmer stands are in the community. Your opinion on the vegan diet? Vegan. I'm a pesco vegetarian. I do fish. I, I haven't had um, red meat in 30 years, pork, none of that. I'll tell you what, a lot more fat, cholesterol, saturated fat. I have heart disease in my family history, number one. But two, when I studied to be a registered dietitian, they made me go to a pork processing plant. When you see them come off the truck, hang up down, they drop the blood and out in a package. And you look at the cured sausage, broth, or hot dogs. I watched them add the fat to those products when they're producing them. Who wants that in their body? So processed, cured, high fat, high sodium, just not good. Maybe you're going to ballpark one time a summer or two times. Okay. I don't know how much we're talking about. Maybe two more questions. Two more questions. Okay. Uh, which one's better with this issue? The farmer's market or whole food? Oh, uh, you know what? I would do farmer's market because you know it's close to you and that food came from a close location. Then I would put whole foods after that. Okay. But I like it. Whole foods are great. You want the fresh, better than the, the frozen. Frozen, much better than the can because you lose nutrients. And then don't boil your huge, your fruits and vegetables because those nutrients, it can destroy them. Or leach out. Okay, one more. Um, what's your take on brown sugar as opposed to white sugar? Is it sugar. Sugar is sugar. Sugar, sugar, honey, sugar. Uh, table sugar, sugar. Brown sugar, sugar. Uh, so include it in that, and as little as possible, experiment with different spices and herbs to try to get the flavor without the extra salt and, and sugar. So, like I said, and I'll leave it this. Look through these. You can have my PowerPoint. Decide, you know, okay, I'm already doing these. I'll set this as a goal. 
And once I have it as part of my normal routine, I'll work toward another goal. Okay. Okay. Live your best life possible. That is my 2023 resolution, and that's what we all should do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation, very informative, and uh, one of the favorite topics to, to many of our patients. And I have a confession to make. Uh, I uh, became uh, plant-based about two years ago. And every time my patients ask me about diet, I try to preach them a little bit about to, ch to change to plant-based. Mm -hmm. That has helped me a lot, okay? And many of our patients who are changing a little bit, and it doesn't have to be radical, mm -hmm. also uh, uh, improve and feel much better. All right, so when some of my patients who may be here and ask me about diet, you will see, you will know what my answer is, okay? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, next in line is uh, Dr. Frank Penedo. Dr. Frank Penedo is a professor of psychology and medicine. He's part of the Cancer Center leadership, a very well a nationally and internationally recognized researcher in psycho-oncology, and one of his areas of interest is issues around survivorship. So Dr. Penedo will talk to us today about survivorship in kidney cancer, which is a very, very important and many times for, forgotten uh, topic uh, uh, during the discussions in kidney cancer. Let me put the time here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Merchan, for the kind intro, and thank you to the foundation for um, inviting me and giving me an opportunity to talk about some of the work that we're doing here uh, in cancer survivorship and also reflect on this concept um, and highlight, unfortunately, the very limited work that has taken place uh, in kidney cancer. Uh, my disclosure is I am a paid consultant for Blue Note Therapeutics, which is digitizing an intervention that we've developed here for uh, breast and prostate cancer survivors. So um, just to put survivorship into context, uh, the concept of survivorship has gained a lot of attention over the past several decades. And uh, the NCI, the American Cancer Society, and other organizations define the cancer survivor as an individual from the day of diagnosis and through the balance of their life. And survivorship care is care that is provided to the individual after primary treatment through the balance of life. You want me to switch? If you want to. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Um, so, and this is important because uh, one of the issues that was detected several decades ago was that rightfully so, patients would get a lot of attention during the diagnostic and treatment planning uh, process. As you would imagine, it's highly necessary and uh, it was, uh, it's needed. But what would happen is after that primary treatment phase and that diagnostic phase, the patient would sort of fall off a cliff. There wouldn't be a lot of attention as to how to manage treatment-related side effects, really understand what the follow-up guidelines were, understand other aspects about their health and how treatment-related side effects or cancer risk intersected with the cancer they have been treated for. So we've seen an unprecedented growth in the number of cancer survivors over the past several years. And of course, early detection and treatment efficacy is accountable for those significant increases that we're seeing. Currently, there's about 20 million survivors in the United States. That number will hit about 26 million in 2040. And that's about 5% of the population in 2040. Unfortunately, survivorship does come with several challenges, and the benefit for many survivors of extended uh, longevity is offset by these challenges. So what becomes central for us working with the survivor is being able to maintain an adequate quality of life, what we call now meaningful survivorship. We want the individuals to live their best possible lives despite having been diagnosed and treated for any specific uh, cancer. So quality of life, it, it's, it's a complex uh, construct. It's got several components to it. Uh, when you think about somebody's quality of life, we typically think about their physical health, how they're functioning physically, how social they are, how much they interact with their family and their friends. We think about their emotional well-being, 
also their financial well-being, and also spiritually how the individual is doing. So it has multiple components to it. It's just not one measure or one index of how the individual is doing. And what we see is that throughout the cancer continuum, from diagnosis all the way through long-term outcomes and end of life, there are multiple psychological and physical challenges that affect our patients. A diagnosis, as you would expect, uncertainty, anxiety, depression, hits to lifestyle factors like nutrition, physical activity, uh, are all affected by a cancer diagnosis. It's a life-shifting event for, for our patients. When the treatment planning begins, the challenges start taking more focus on the treatment planning, the decision making, what type of treatment am I gonna get, how is this gonna impact my chances of recurrence and my chances of survival, and of course decision making becomes central to this process, and as we have newer treatments available, this process keeps getting more and more complex for the patients and for their families. Once treatment begins, we have the symptom burden associated with treatment. We know that those treatment-related side effects can persist well beyond the active treatment period. And of course, throughout the long-term follow-up period, we have late effects that continue to persist well beyond treatment. We have surveillance for secondary cancers or recurrences or even new cancers. And the experience, and, and I was telling my, my colleague, Dr. Redalara, it's like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like this is a major challenge and so depressing. The average cancer patient adjusts really well to these challenges. But there are conditions that exacerbate these experiences and create a risk, if you will, for the individual not doing as well. And these are pretty, make, make a lot of sense. If the individual has comorbidities, if they have Premorbid dysfunction, meaning before they were diagnosed with cancer, they had mental health issues with depression or anxiety. Of course, the severity of disease, social determinants of health like insurance, access to health care, and lifestyle factors. Again, you heard about the importance of nutrition, physical activities right up there as well. If somebody didn't really engage in those healthy practices before a cancer diagnosis, it's not that easy to pick that up right after being diagnosed and treated. The challenge that we have upon us is that when these challenges exist, we know that they're common, but we don't do a great job at assessing them and capturing them and then helping the patients manage these challenges. And that's part of what survivorship does. It focuses on how to address all these challenges throughout the cancer continuum for our patients. If we look at symptom burden, which is a big focus of survivorship care, symptoms like anxiety, pain, difficulty sleeping and fatigue are quite common. These are rates of individuals of several cancers, and as you can see, the higher rates that we see are typically fatigue, sleep, pain, anxiety, and then some other uh, symptoms or symptom burden across several different uh, cancers that vary in terms of the percent of patients that report them. But the point being is that you know, 20 percent of the population or higher is, is a pretty high number of individuals voicing these or, or reporting these symptoms. We also know that our survivors are reporting a high level of unmet needs, and that means that they have a problem, and the problem is not being effectively addressed during their cancer care. And uh, this is a study from Canada. Now, Canada has a health system that it's, it's structured in several different ways, but we can draw from this for our own health system. So this is 10,000 cancer survivors, and if we look at the data, these are the percent of patients that voiced a concern. So 68% said fatigue was a problem for them. About 40% they had issues with memory or um, concentration. Almost 50% issues with sexuality, depression, far more with anxiety. And then look at the percentages of patients that said that this, met, that this need remained unmet, meaning that they had the problem, they had the concern, but it's not being met. They're not being treated for it, and if they're being treated, it hasn't resolved. Um, we also have disparities on our hands. Uh, I'm not going to focus on, on all the disparities, but just as an example, we have mental health disparities in cancer. This is a study looking at uh, multi-ethnic cancer survivors, and if you look at black or Latino patients, the red bars are patients with cancer, the blue bars are individuals without cancer, and you can see significantly elevated rates uh, in black and Latino relative to non-Hispanic whites, Asians, and multi-race uh, individuals. 
Now, another challenge that we face is that we're going to hit a shortage of oncologists and primary care physicians uh, in the very near future. Uh, the workforce is growing older. We estimate that there's going to be a shortage of over 2,000 oncologists by 2025 in the United States alone. And Miami, unfortunately, is one of the top metropolitan areas where we're going to have uh, that, that shortage. Uh, but it's not a Miami problem only. It's a problem across many states in the United States. So collectively, if we start looking at disparities in outcomes, uh, I showed depression, but we also have disparities not, al not only in response to treatment, but also quality of life and the symptom burden that our patients report, the chronicity or the persistence of those late effects of treatment like fatigue, cognitive problems, an aging population, which by definition means that these individuals are gonna have more comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension, mm -hmm knowledge deficits in primary care providers, which are going to have to absorb the care for many of these survivors, and then other pressures that we have. Uh, we, we are my colleagues, not, not myself, but colleagues like Catherine Alfano, who used to be with the American Cancer Society, has referred as having a perfect storm in our hands coming up to us in terms of providing effective care to our patients and survivors. So not surprisingly, the Institute of Medicine, or now National Academy of Sciences, has made a clear call for us to make sure that we're addressing these unmet needs, meaning that we implement patient-centered assessments, meaning that we administer to our patients and our survivors measures, questionnaires, or interviews that tap into these needs to make sure that we capture when they're persistent, when they're a problem, and that we provide a referral so that they're treated effectively for this. And we also want to make sure that we're not fragmenting the care of these patients. Uh, I don't have time to get into those details, but also even coordinating care for our patients can be challenging. Many of our patients don't have a primary care provider, and they're dealing with comorbidities like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and those are central issues, particularly as people are living longer post a cancer diagnosis, Many ca cancers, specifically prostate cancer, those men are most likely, in early stage disease, are most likely going to die of cardiovascular disease, which is fed by those other uh, comorbidities. So here at Sylvester, and as in many other cancer centers, we have a comprehensive supportive care and survivorship program that provides uh, distress screening and documents referrals of those screenings to address emotional well-being, physical function, nutrition, practical needs like transportation and childcare, things that are not only unmet needs, but also issues that can get in the way of the patient receiving adequate care. And we also have a pretty robust survivorship program, meaning that we focus on providing prevention strategies like promoting healthy lifestyles, surveillance, making sure that we're monitoring disease activity and uh, physical and psychological late effects of treatment, care coordination, making sure that the primary care providers that patients have get information about the patient's cancer, and if they don't have a primary care provider, that we link them to the community, and also intervention, programs that develop uh, or, or, or programs that deliver psychosocial programs to address uh, these needs. We also have a very comprehensive cancer support services program uh, where we provide a myriad of services including acupuncture, massage, physical therapy, uh, psychology, psychiatry, uh, exercise physiology, nutrition, all to help our patients navigate some of the challenges they have. Uh, we are moving towards a model of uh, implementing survivorship care clinics or survivorship wellness clinics. Rather, these are clinics that uh, take place in tandem with the oncology care. It's not a transfer of care model. It doesn't bypass oncology care in any way. It just creates a space and an encounter for the patient so that they can address these many unmet needs that I've been talking about so that the oncologist is laser focused on the disease activity and the management of the cancer for the patient. If I have my relative saying, Dr. Marchand, I don't want him to be spending time talking about you know, depression and you know, how to get transportation in or what you should be eating, not eating. I want to make sure that that encounter is primarily focused on the cancer care for that patient. And if there's time left over, you can recommend vegan, of course. Uh, but, but we want to make sure that those oncology encounters are optimized to treat the disease itself. So this is part of what these clinics uh, will accomplish. 
So with kidney cancer survivorship, uh, I know this is probably very familiar to you all. It's not one of the, it's the sixth and ninth most common cancer in men and women, about 80,000 diagnoses every year. Unfortunately, it, fortunately and unfortunately, rates keep increasing because of imaging. So for example, we have several studies that are doing imaging for other conditions and are detecting uh, suspicious lesions that get patients referred, and in those cases, we can detect kidney cancer when otherwise it wouldn't have been detected due to lack of symptoms. Uh, there's about 14,000 annual de deaths, and survival rates tend to vary depending on the stage of the diagnosis. And there are several established risk factors like smoking, male gender, black race, hypertension, dialysis, and family history. And of course, there's a variety of treatments and new emerging treatments which can be highly effective, but also can be toxic and create uh, symptom burden for our patients. So collectively, these treatments create a significant symptom burden. And I want to focus a little bit on how do we assess the symptom burden of our patients so that we can help them manage them and again focus on improving uh, their quality of life. Uh, I do want to say that it's not all bad news in terms of the symptoms and, and, and the challenges that our patients have. These are uh, rates of patients that have early stage uh, kidney cancer, and if you look at the blue bars, those are control values of various indices of quality of life and other psychosocial functioning. And the red bar is one to two years after kidney cancer treatment, and the green bar is over two years after treatment. And we see this pattern where, as you would expect, there's a dip in the different indices right after treatment, but then the patients bounce back, which is great news. So it does tell us that these concerns are prevalent, they occur, but that also it's not only about when, how you assess, but when do you assess it, and that one to two year period immediately post-treatment seems to be critical because that's when the patients are gonna be experiencing the greatest decrements in these multiple areas of uh, quality uh, of life. If we look at uh, symptoms more specifically, these are localized and metastatic uh, participants. Uh, in a study, and as you can see, again, a high prevalence of the cases. I failed to mention earlier, one of the challenges that we have in kidney cancer is that we really don't have a strong evidence base or literature describing these symptom experiences. There's studies here and there that help us put a story together, but if you look at the sample size, this is a small sample size, probably not very stable finding, so um, I'm always making a call that we need to focus on more qualitative, descriptive research so that we can better understand the patient experience in kidney cancer. I did want to mention briefly this concept of um, financial toxicity. It's a term that has gained a lot of attention re recently over the past several years, and it's now being conceptualized as a component of quality of life for a patient. Uh, I don't think I have to tell this group the financial burden that cancer places on an individual and his or her family. The fact that a lot of bankruptcies in the United States are attributed to cancer itself. So there's more and more attention being given as to how can we help the patients manage the stress associated with, the, with these financial pressures uh, that the individuals uh, face. So that's another area that's very important. This is. A meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis just means a collection of a whole bunch of studies and trying to reconcile all the data together to see what's the key message, the take-home message. Uh, this is uh, unmet needs in renal can carcinoma survivors, and interestingly enough, psychological and emotional needs tends to be the most reported unmet need for these patients. And when we're talking about, and Dr. Redalara will talk about this too, we're not talking about a clinical depression or an anxiety level that's impairing and completely debilitating, but levels of anxiety and depression that are bad enough that they interfere with an individual's quality of life and daily functioning. And we see from the literature and the work that has been done, although limited, that psychological functioning is a problem for, for our patients. Then you have physical needs, as you would expect, and then uh, a variety of other needs that our patients uh, report. Um, I wanted to, to mention the importance of capturing the patient experience, something that we call patient reported outcomes. And it's basically a, a fancy way of saying, rather than me as a clinician looking at you and saying, oh, you're depressed or you're anxious or you look fatigued, 
asking you in a very structured manner about your experience so I can get a very well clinically validated score that tells me where you fall relative to individuals that have not been treated for cancer, individuals who are not experiencing whatever it is that we're measuring. And the reason why that is very important, this is a very influential study back from 2016 that basically showed that clinicians relative to an individual, a patient filling out a measure, clinicians were more likely to miss uh, or underreport the symptoms rather than if you ask the patient. So when you look at the rates, they're pretty, pretty striking. So 74% of anorexia, 41% of nausea vomiting, uh, of nausea and 47% of vomiting, and it goes on constipation, diarrhea, hair loss, and uh, several others that are not listed. Again, think about the encounter with the oncologist. The oncologist has to focus on the patient's cancer and the biomarkers, diagnostics, how the patient is doing. There's not a lot of time to do this. So how can we get to measure all these components in a way that we can capture? Is that my time up? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, so talking about stress, okay. Uh, <laughs> So, so the, way that we, the way that we do this, the way that we measure this, is we use a program called My Wellness Check. And through My Wellness Check, uh, it's a program that's given uh, for all our ambulatory oncology patients. So these are non-hospitalized coming into the clinic to see an oncologist. They get a monthly prompt through the patient portal, and we conduct an e-health assessment of these patient-reported outcomes. So we assess pain, fatigue, physical function, uh, anxiety, depression, nutritional needs, practical needs, and rehabilitation needs. And uh, these measures are scored in real time within the patient portal, and if the patient has a clinically elevated level, and these are well clinically validated measures, or has a concern or a need like transportation or childcare that they need help with, an alert is sent in real time to the appropriate provider. So it could be social work, psychology, their medical team, uh, et cetera. So this is just to show, give you an idea of what these alerts look like. Uh, nutrition is our biggest concern for our patients. In fact, we used to have a pretty broad nutrition assessment that we had to correct because over 75% of our patients were saying they wanted to talk to a nutritionist. Now we use a Nutri-Score, which is a measure that adjusts for the seaside treatment type, uh, the C stage, and it creates with an algorithm whether the patient has to be referred or not. Uh, to, to a nutritionist. Uh, the biggest concerns that they uh, report is need for coping with their illness and needs for financial uh, counseling from, from our, our system. In kidney cancer, so we looked at this data, we looked at kidney cancer survivors relative to everybody else, so we find that about 7% of our patients report clinically elevated anxiety, about 6% clinically elevated depression, and this is now problematic levels of anxiety and depression, but for kidney patients, those rates are much higher. They're significantly higher. We're not quite sure why that's the case, but they do report higher levels of psychological distress. And if we look at their, report, their reported needs, uh, the top is help to be supported to help them cope with the cancer, financial concerns, and general cancer education. These are kidney cancer survivors. Uh, reporting uh, these specific needs. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to make some concluding remarks. So there are multiple survivorship challenges that, that our patients have uh, that compromise quality of life and health outcomes. We have advances in technology. I didn't have time to get into this, but we've developed really strong interventions that have created an evidence base for the utility of these programs for cancer survivors, breast cancer survivors, in some cases, colorectal cancer survivors, but we really haven't done this in kidney cancer. We haven't uh, disseminated or implemented those models in that population. So programs that are now available in kidney cancer remain very limited. There's just not a whole lot out there that shows us or have programs available to deal with the challenges that they face. Uh, but we can adapt these other models that we have in other diseases. If we can bring patients together into manualized programs that are led by a licensed psychologist, a psychiatrist, a social worker, and teach them skills to manage and navigate the challenges of survivorship, 
I'm sure that we can, uh, we can improve the outcomes. And we do need a better understanding of the challenges of these patients. Again, some of the data that I showed comes from a very limited literature. I think we need a lot more qualitative and descriptive work, uh, drawing also from the CKD literature, where actually there's been more work, particularly in understanding the utility of psychosocial programs. So with that, I'll stop, apologize for uh, going over, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Well, uh, I have a question in regards to the to the program that Investor is uh, doing for survivorship, uh, patient-related outcomes. Um, can you uh, tell us uh, uh, what do you see in the future in terms of the efforts that Investor uh, is working on or can do? To, uh, to further refine these uh, patient-related outcomes and how do you think that could help patients and providers? Sure, absolutely. Uh, that's a great question. So I think that the my wellness check, the assessment, is a key component, making sure that we're regularly asking the patient how they're doing. Uh, a benefit of that is that if we catch fatigue in time, uh, decompensating physical functioning in time, we're able to intervene in time. The medical team can step in and try to better understand what might be leading. They may need a medication adjustment. They may need uh, some like physical activity, nutritional counseling, or something to help them with those conditions. So we know that individuals that go through the My Wellness Check program have a lower likelihood of ending up in an emergency room or hospitalized. We've been able to publish that data for the general ambulatory oncology uh, population. The ultimate goal in the future of this is what we refer to as risk stratification. Our patients are very heterogeneous, meaning they're very different. Some patient may have a lot of issues with fatigue, no problem with nutrition. Other patient may have major nutritional problems, major depressive problems. We want to be as specific and precise as possible in detecting that and getting the patient to the right level of care. We've already started to do that. The problem with uh, the, my wellness check is that about 45% of our patients complete those questionnaires. So we're missing a lot. 55% of our patient population is not doing it. So, so uh, and that is also a kind of like a take-home message. I guess that every patient investor gets that opportunity yeah. to feel. So our recommendation uh, to all our kidney cancer patients is to try to fill those uh, questionnaires when you get it online because that will help us understand the challenges that our patients are having so we can then take measures to overcome them, right? Mm -hmm. So it is very important. And also, uh, Dr. Penedo and I are collaborating and will be collaborating to uh, uh, extend these efforts of patient-related or, or patient-reported outcomes and side effects into research, which is something very, very new and hopefully, Sylvester will be at the forefront of those efforts in, in, in having patients provide uh, information to us outside of the clinic, outside of the, of the clinical trials, in order for us to detect side effects earlier, and hopefully that will lead to better outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least, uh, I would like to introduce to Dr. Maria Rueda Lara. Dr. Maria Rueda Lara is a faculty at the uh, University of Miami in Sylvester. She's a psychiatrist. She uh, treats and follows many of our patients who have emotional or psychological issues. So uh, Dr. Rueda Lara will talk about uh, psychological aspects in kidney cancer. So I'm really excited of participating in this symposium. I'm gonna be talking about emotional psychological impact of kidney cancer. Dr. Panetto focused on survivors, cancer survivors, and I'm gonna be focusing on the cancer journey. So as Dr. Mershan said, I'm a psychiatrist, but I'm a psychiatrist and I did extra training to treat patients with chronic medical conditions. And I've been working with um, cancer patients since 2006, and that's my passion. Um, and I'm happy to be here. So, how the cancer journey starts is when patients have a symptom that could be an indicator that could be cancer. 
And that's when the uncertainty begins, and this means like, could this, be, could this mean cancer? Uh, even before patients see a doctor or have test biopsy, the, the life transform into a life of maybe well-being and certainty to a life of uncertainty. Um, I'm gonna share that a few years ago I had a biopsy and could have been cancer and then my mind went to places I was very stressed out, and I, I, I felt what patients felt or feel when, when they are dealing with, with these type of situations. I did things that I told my patients not to do. I went and checked on the intern. I did everything that I was not supposed to do. I'm, I'm honest, and I'm a psychiatrist, but my mind went to places that were not healthy for me. Everybody deals with stress differently. Everybody brings that um, unique way of dealing with uncertainty and cope differently. So the first stage when somebody's confronted with cancer could be a stage of denial of disbelief, could this be in cancer. Um, during that moment, the uncertainty, anxiety, patients cannot sleep, feel extremely anxious, sad. Those feelings are completely normal. You are not crazy when experiencing this. The second stage is when learning that it is cancer, and that brings a period of restlessness, fear, helplessness, hopelessness, um, appetite changes, and that is completely normal. That could last one to two weeks. And the turmoil is a normal response to threat and uncertainty. The third stage is then after meeting with the doctor, adjusting to the cancer diagnosis, knowing that a treatment is going to start and patients start feeling like, finally, I'm doing something about it. Whatever it is, but uh, 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 I'm in the right track, I learned what I have, I met with the doctor, and I'm learning. Everybody copes differently with cancer and stress. Studies show that what works best is to deal head on with the issues of illness and treatment, seeing them as problems to be solved. There are some patients that they have the ostrich syndrome, and instead of dealing with the situation, they bury our, their heads in the sand, passively refusing to deal with the diagnose, diagnosis realistically. There are different ways of coping with cancer that could be beneficial and healthy, like having enough information about the treatment, its goals, and possible side effects having a caring medical team that is supportive and reassurance, and I cannot speak more highly of um, Anna and Dr. Mershan, because I learned that from my patients. <laughs> having a caring nurse who can interpret the doctor's communications, having support from others, having a be belief system or philosophy of life that gives meaning to a stressful situations, um, a way of what I learned from my patients that the way, for instance, like a parent deals with cancer is a meaningful way to teach their, their children how to deal with uncertainty and how to confront of life. And that is a life lesson for children. And even though they're suffering when dealing with cancer, that is an important lesson and that is a legacy for, for children and adult children. Something that also helps helps with coping with cancer, seeking counseling to change behaviors or ways of coping that are counterproductive. Factors that hinder how you cope is being a person who's generally negative to our life and its problems, unable to think one day at a time and worries about the future, thinking about what's gonna happen in 10 years instead of like focusing on one day at a time, pessimistic by nature and can easily feel helpless in the face of stress, Using avoidance as a main coping strategy, prompt to become nervous and distressed in the face of challenge, reluctant to persist in the face of stress and can easily become overwhelmed and feel hopeless, unable to see the humorous side of negative things. This is Dr. Jimmy Holland. Um, I had the fortune to be mentored by her. She was the um, 
the pioneer and created the field of psych oncology at Sloan Kettering. Her husband was an oncologist and she was a psychiatrist. And in the 70s, she saw that the oncologists were talking about treatments and chemotherapies and she was telling her husband, who is taking care of the emotional aspects of cancer? So she decided to create the field of psych oncology and then she trained many of us and even it went to the point to go to Africa and, cre and created like different societies. So she died in 2018 and I miss her because she was a great mentor. So in her book of human side of cancer, she came up with this do, do's and don'ts mantras. And one was like, don't believe that cancer equals death, especially with the research. Uh, cancer diagnosis doesn't determine that you're gonna die right away, but as uh, I'm sure like in previous conferences, you learned there's a lot of research going on, like new treatments. Do not blame yourself for causing your cancer. Don't keep your worries or symptoms to yourself. Talk to others, talk to your doctors. Rely on friends and family members. Don't feel guilty if you cannot keep a positive attitude all the time. She um, referred to this as like the tyranny, tyranny, tyranny of positive thinking. It's not normal to be positive all the time. It is normal to have days that you're tired, you're dealing with side effects, you're not feeling so positive, and to have a moment that you feel down. That is completely normal. That makes you human. Um, don't suffer in silence. Talk to others, reach out, seek professional help. Don't be embarrassed to seek counseling. And um, one of my oncology colleagues, like he refers everyone to us, and then, because patients are like, I have cancer, why do I need to see a psychiatrist? Mm -hmm. And uh, so then this colleague says, she doesn't see crazy patients, she sees cancer patients. That's what he uses, but then what we're with, here for. <laughs> uh, do use relaxation techniques to cope. Do find a doctor who lets you ask all of your questions. That's very important to feel comfortable with the doctor that you go there, you can say that you feel like you're being listened. Do keep a personal notebook with all of your dates for treatments. I'm sure before appointments, we always have like questions, so write them down before you go. Go with someone, because sometimes we're so afraid waiting for the results of a scan or a biopsy, and then we forget. So if you go with a family member, they write down the questions and they can advocate for you do rely on ways of coping that help you in the past. Do cope with cancer, again, one day at a time. So what problems require professional help? Feeling overwhelmed by fear and distress, but those feelings that get in your way to the extent that you are barely able to carry on your work, take care of you and your family or basic daily activities. When there's a change of mood or mental function, the pre uh, depression is sadness that has become persistent and pathological with a constellation of symptoms of clinical depression. Being sad one day doesn't mean you have a clinical depression, but then if it's the sad sadness persists and you're unable to enjoy life. I remember uh, I saw once a patient from Argentina, it was during the World Cup, it was an avid soccer fan and during that time at the hospital, the World Cup was happening and then the patient had no interest in, in watching Argentina playing. That for me was an indicator of depression, not him telling me it was sad because he really lacked interest, he was not interested at all in, in the World Cup. Um, previous history of emotional problems. There are patients who have like phobia or their fear of needles and if they're they're in this journey, they're probably gonna be exposed to, to that and, and they, they can get some help to deal with, with the needles. Uh, patients who are like have agoraphobia or they cannot be in confined spaces, if they're gonna go to radiation or scans, they can seek help to help them cope when they have to have those procedures done. Um, when there's a sudden change in mood or mental function during cancer treatment, during the cancer treatment, there are medications that are important, necessary. For instance, uh, you may need to be on a steroid, dexamethasone, or you need to be taking some pain medications. Those medications can have emotional side effects. 
Some patients can become more tearful when they're in a steroid. They can have insomnia. Um, they can become irritable. They're more sensitive. So pay attention to those symptoms when you're taking any medical treatment. I remember once I, I, I took, I forgot, levofloxacin. I couldn't sleep that night. I was completely up, awake and, and wired. So any medication can have side effects. Also, there are physical symptoms that cause distress, pain, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, problems with concentration, and insomnia. Those symptoms can affect your mood, so pay attention to those and talk to your doctor because there, there may be um, other medications that can help you deal with those side effects. Other problems that require professional help, unfortunately, um, patients who are dealing with cancer, they lose a loved one, a pet, or they have other stressors in life. So that's what we call like double whammy. Uh, seek help if you're feeling down. Um, when parents or other family members have died from cancer. Um, memories of major trauma earlier in life that research and can cause distress when diagnosed with cancer. I treated patients who were Holocaust survivors and then being diagnosed with cancer, they relived trauma or even other previous trauma. There are different unhealthy way of coping. Some patients um, start smoking more, they overeat, maybe lots of sugar. She's laughing up in the background. Yes, <laughs> over drinking alcohol, which is not healthy, um, too busy to take care of yourself, like working, just uh, forgetting to get lab work, uh, not exercising, laying out too long in sun, not using sunblock. So what can you do? Talk to your doctor if you're having any symptoms of, of distress. Keep in mind that certain medical conditions and cancer treatment can affect your mood. Seek out mental health professionals, social workers, licensed mental health counselors, psychologists, or psychiatrists. There are different talk therapies, and it's important to choose a counselor who has expertise in the treatment of cancer. Um, I want to be talking more about cancer support services and, and what we could offer, pastoral counsel, counseling, your pastor, your rabbi. There are different types of therapy. There are therapy to help you uh, to solve problems. Uh, there are therapy that you get support. Um, when patients have sexual side effects, there's also sexual counseling. There's like individual and group therapy. There are some patients that prefer to talk to someone on one-to-one -one and they feel uncomfortable talking to others in front of others in a group therapy set, um, setting. Medications to control distress. There are a lot of fears that um, we all have when taking medications. Like, oh, I may, be, I, may, I may be a zombie if I take it. I may get addicted. Um, I have cancer, and, and you can change it with a pill. I have to be strong and face this thing on my own. I'd be ashamed if people knew that I have to take drugs for my nerves. They think uh, I'm, uh, I may be crazy. I'm afraid that medicine that medicine you want to give me for my cancer my fight with cancer medicines. So there are medications that are non-addictive that can help to treat depression or anxiety. Um, when I prescribe a medication for a patient, I usually make sure that I check for medication interactions. If a patient is on a clinical trial, I reach out to Dr. Merchan, can I prescribe this medication? So it's important that even the pharmacy the pharmacist at your local pharmacy can, can run interactions of your medications if you have some concerns. There are medications that you can take for a short period of time that can relieve anxiety, for instance, like a benzodiazepine before you have a scan. If you're very anxious, you don't need to suffer. You can ask Dr. Marchand, he can give or Anna, they can give you a medication and you feel more relaxed going through that exam. Um, antidepressants are indicated when patients meet criteria for a major depressive disorder is sadness that is persistent, that is affecting or interfering with daily functioning. Uh, there's some patients that get to a point that are so sad that they have thoughts about wanting to die. So therapy, talk therapy, antidepressants can help. And 
the antidepressants are medications that are, there are different kinds um, that they need to be taken on a regular basis and they don't need to be taken for the rest of patient's life, but at least for, for several months, at least six months to, to help with, uh, with that. There are antidepressants that have side effects that I prescribe that are beneficial to patients. And I'm referring to uh, antidepressants that increase appetite. Some can help with nausea, some can help with insomnia. Um, there are other medications, uh, patients, and I'm gonna talk about um, cognitive deficits for cancer treatment that could help with that. Um, be aware also that side effects from cancer treatment um, can mimic mood and emotional symptoms. When patients start on immunotherapy, there are, there are immunotherapy that cause severe fatigue, lack of energy, um, and that is not necessarily mean that someone is depressed. It's a physical symptom, and it's not that, oh, I don't want to do things. It's just like I'm severely fatigued that I cannot move, and it's just a side effect from the cancer treatment. There is a condition that is common in cancer patients. It's called cancer-related cognitive impairment, what people call chemo brain. Um, it's one of the most frequently reported post-chemotherapy symptoms among cancer survivors. Healthcare providers who study cancer treatment and cognition estimate that 25 to 30 percent of people who have chemo brain develop symptoms before they start cancer treatment. And about 75 of people receiving cancer treatment tell their healthcare they're having issues with memory attention and their ability to complete tasks. So what are the symptoms? Like having trouble thinking of the right word for a particular object, doing things that um, once come easily, like adding up numbers in your head, having trouble following the flow of a conversation, having a short attention span or trouble focusing on a specific task of idea having trouble multitasking, so you feel you need to do one thing at a time, feeling sluggish, tired, or not having energy, feeling clumsy, as if something's wrong with your motor skills. Not, this also can, uh, can present, not necessarily related to chemotherapy treatment, but also when someone has anemia, uh, low blood counts, and even uh, as a side effect from the medications uh, they're taking. So how long does it uh, last? People may have chemo brain for, for very amount of times. It can last for several months to several years. So what to do? Let people know you're dealing with chemotherapy, brain fog. Keep track of your triggers. Um, if, if you know that if you start multitasking, it's, it's difficult to concentrate, just try to pick one task at a time. Um, create easy to follow routines. Get enough rest and sleep, that is extremely important. When we don't sleep, it is hard to focus <coughs> or concentrate. That's for me, yes. Give your brain a daily workup. Puzzle applications, there are applications like Lumosity the, um, that can help train in your brain. And remain active if possible. There is no standard treatment, but there are some medications that can help, like um, wakefulness promoting agents like modafinil, or psychostimulants like Ritalin, um, they're sure acting and can help with energy. So I'm gonna talk about um, some of our services, the Cancer Support Services at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. We'd had hybrid services, in person and virtual. We have art therapy, exercise physiology, spiritual care, music therapy, nutrition services, psychiatry and psychology. We have also group interventions and other cancer support services like patient-to-patient -patient mentorship, social work services, support groups, weeks and head coverings, acupuncture, massage therapy. And this is our number um, for you to contact us and we offer massage therapy for free if you wanna go to one of the, the clinics and get a massage. And if you wanna talk to any of us, and again, we take care of cancer patients only. Thank you. Any questions, comments? I have a question. Yes. So oftentimes we have problems with patients who have problems with the insurance covering, let's say, psychotherapy, right? And, uh, and we see the need. Uh, how, 
what would you what would you recommend uh, for these patients with this kind of problem? So the first thing would be to refer the patient to the, to the social work department so they can do a screening and assessment and an evaluation and see what the patient's needs are. And we have a list of providers in the community, but also we're working um, with Dr. Panetto and to develop a, like, something called a co collaborative care model where patients can receive treatment is independent of insurance and we're working on that because unfortunately that's how the healthcare system is. It carves out mental health um, and is very, very challenging. So we're trying to be creative to provide that service to everyone. You. You're welcome. Any other questions? When the patient comes to the clinic, there are two groups of caregivers, right? The core caregivers, but any, any, any cancer prostate cancer, blood cancer, whatever cancer. So I'm just thinking, in terms of the sequence of visit of the patient, so I have a feeling there will be a lot of impact of this program and your program, especially after seeing the core caregiver, either before or after. Yes. If any one of your team member or his team member talks to the patient even for 15 minutes, it, 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 it need not be a prolonged session, 30 minutes or 40 minutes or one hour. Even 15 minutes, how will it go with the doctor machine? So how do you feel? And uh, regarding the follow-up visits and all. So, so sort of a psychotherapy, I should say. Uh, sort of a part of the strong therapy, I should say. It will have a lot of impact on the patient either before and after the visit to the core care. That's my comment about your service and Dr. Pernod's service. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question, Dr. Lara. Um, so we, we focus on the patient's uh, well-being, emotional issues, and also uh, we, uh, uh, when we see the patients in the families, we always and we also see uh, challenges, emotional challenges for the caregivers, right? Can you comment on how this plays uh, into the interactions with the patient, like uh, uh, emotional issues with caregivers, who as a result of the diagnosis of cancer, caregivers also uh, uh, do feel uh, emotional and psychological issues. How do you think that can affect the care of the patients and, and what, what do you think they can do? Or, or, or uh, uh, how can we intervene on that? So caregivers, have to deal with a lot and it's extremely important that they reach out and seek out for help. I know um, at Sylvester Cancer Center we have a caregiver support and it's important to even talk to the oncologist or other doctor, even to the social worker, I need help. So, and unfortunately like I, in my career I had caregivers who got to the point that um, ended up like, you know, uh, committing suicide because it was too overwhelming. So it is extremely important. Caregivers are also a population that requires yeah. a lot of support. I agree. Any other questions? So we are finishing maybe two or three minutes before the time, which is great. So all of us can go home. I want to thank you again, all of you, patients, caregivers, staff members who have come here uh, have sacrificed a Saturday to come and join us and hopefully this was something useful for you, educational and uh, uh, like this one of the taken message is that we as, as investors are here for you. Okay? We have a team of dedicated uh, people with the experience and the expertise to treat kidney cancer, not only how to treat with medications, but a team of specialists okay, who uh, cover the whole spectrum of treatment for patients with kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will be happy. We are always open for suggestions. Uh, if you have friends who have kidney cancer and who are struggling, we will be happy to come and see them and help them as well. Okay? And uh, uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank you again and hope to see you next year.
this was very successful. Thank you very much. <laughs>